Good evening, everyone. I said, good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? If you are ready for a grown-up conversation on race, class, and poverty, let me hear you say yes. I want America to hear you say it again. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the town, National Town Hall meeting with Repairs of the Breach. We are so honored to have all of you here tonight. My name is Reverend Erica Williams, and I have the honor of serving as one of the National Social Justice Organizers. So tonight we ask of you, before we start, to please cut off or silent cell phones, um, because tonight we are broadcasting this town hall all across the country. I would say even across the world, people are able to click on live stream to watch us. So we want to make sure that people can hear the conversation, okay? All right. And so also we want to make sure that everybody here, please, how many of you are on social media? That's the whole room. If you are, we need for you to take your phone out right now and we need you to check in. Tell folks where you are. Where are my students at? Whose campus are we on tonight? Who? I see your president here. I think he would want you to say a little louder. All right, let the world know where we are tonight, okay? All right, check in telling them where you are and use the hashtag moral resistance. It's here on the bottom of the screen. Moral resistance. And also, please do that. So go ahead and check in now. And throughout the night, please tweet, text, do all of that great stuff, okay? So people can also engage in this conversation. And so also we ask of you, if, any, if you received the index card, you should have. If you did not, raise your hand, and we can have a student bring one to you. Index cards. If you have any questions, we're asking for you to write your question on that card. And after our video segment, we're gonna collect those cards and, the, and some of those questions will be picked during our question and answer period, okay? So if you have a burning question, not a statement, a question, we ask you to fill out the index card and please turn it in to, there'll be two students on each aisle that you can turn it in, they'll have a brown basket that you can put the cards in, okay? There are some folks who's raising their hands, okay? So without further ado, I am going to introduce the Executive Director of Repairs of the Breach, Ms. Rosalind Pellis. She will come and take us further in our program. Good evening. We are here this evening to engage in an important discussion. We are at a time more than ever when we need to be talking to each other, talking about the important issues that uh, matter to us and to people around this country. We're talking about race, we're talking about poverty, and we're talking about class at this time when these are important discussions. They're discussions that don't happen often, so we are all glad to be in here. We've got some wonderful people here tonight to, to guide us in the discussion and we want them to talk to each other, and then we want to talk to them and to each other. So I think we'll have a great night tonight, and are you up for this kind of conversation? Yes. Have you been waiting on this kind of conversation? Yes. And so our hope is that this will only be the beginning, that this is not a conversation that ends tonight, but that goes on, because the times require it. So we're so glad to have you here. I'm the executive director of the Repairers of the Breach. Repairers of the Breach is a national organization whose work grows out of the work that you have done here in North Carolina to change this state, to take this state back. And so people all over this country have been asking, to, to asking what have you, what, what's happened here. And so Repairers of the Breach has been set up to take these lessons all across this country. So people are aware of the good work that's happened in here, and people want to know those lessons. So people across the country are so happy that y'all have done the kind of work that we've done here in this state to make a difference and to be a light for other states. So we thank you for that. So I think without further ado, we need to get our program going. We are here tonight at St. Augustine University 
a wonderful historic school that has brought up so many leaders in this country that continues to teach people how to, how to stand strong, how to fight for what's right, how to get a good education, and how to use that in their communities. So we're so happy and honored to be here tonight. So I'd really like to have a really warm welcome for President Everett Ward, who's the president of this great university. So Dr. Ward. I think you've got a few fans out there. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of St. Augustine's University, it is my honor to host Reverend Dr. William Barber and the Repairs of the Breach Organization for this very important town hall meeting on the campus of St. Augustine's University. As we celebrate the 150th founding of St. Augustine's, it's imperative that we come together to discuss current events of the day in these United States that demand our attention as students, educators, community activists, political leaders, philanthropists, and community activists. We must speak up and speak out on issues that are affecting people around this nation and around this world. That deserves a round of applause. As many of us have realized, it's imperative that we collectively must resist any notions that one group of people is more or less deserving of respect, resources, and educational opportunities because of race, religion, or their socioeconomic status. St. Augustine's University, an intellectual community with a rich legacy is committed to developing a new generation of scholars that are unapologetically devoted to public service. So tonight, on behalf of St. Augustine's University and the students of St. Augustine's University, we are honored to welcome Dr. Barber and the repairs of the breach here on this historic campus as we join you in saying that freedom belongs to all of us. God bless you and welcome to St. Augustine's University. So I talked a little bit about repairs of the breach and now I'd like to take a few minutes to show you some of our work. Oh, somebody's hurting our families. It's gone on. That if we don't get afraid, God knows the troubling of the war. God respects the poor. God exalts the poor. God cares for the poor. God feeds the poor. God remembers the poor. God helps the poor. So when Jesus quotes this Deuteronomy 15, he, he quotes this phrase not because he's condoning poverty then when he but he's reminding us that God hates poverty. That God has commanded us to end poverty by forgiving debts, by raising wages, by outlawing slavery, by restructuring society around the needs of the poor. And that we'll only have the poor with you always if we're disobedient to God and God's will and God's commandments. My friends, economic sustainability, living wages is a moral issue. Education is a moral issue, healthcare, the moral issue, the environment is a moral issue, addressing the disparities in our criminal justice system that impact black, brown, and poor white people is a moral issue, protecting and expanding voting rights and immigrant rights and LGBTQ rights and women's rights and Native Americans and labor issues. Those are moral issues. Sometimes 
God needs a thing created to move us from lip syncing to action. We are humbled to host this holy convocation for the purposes of tikkun olam, to repair our world, to heal a world that sorely needs healing. Today we stand as truth tellers, witnessing to the pain and the suffering caused by the injustices within our community and across our country. We gather to declare that we need a moral revival, a radical revolution of values, and we are called on the prophets of old from the sacred text of the world's religions. We come together, red, yellow, black, and white, uh, people of faith for sustainability, for humanity, for our children, for seven generations to come. Tonight we stand to replace legislation of fear with statutes of surety, manifestations of hate with respect for all humanity, from those of every faith and non-faith, and the baleful devastation of greed with a promise to uphold the well-being of every individual, regardless of race, gender, religion, nationality, culture, or creed. We join voice with voice until all are heard, and arm in arm until all are seen. God is recruiting you. I want to know, are you willing to be a part of that association? Are you willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me? No more standing down. We are going to fight for the heart and the soul of America with every breath we have. Brothers and sisters, this is time for a moral revolution of values in this country. And this uh, video shows some of the work we've been doing. Tonight's event is part of a three-day training. That's what we do at Repairs of the Breach. We go all across this country training people how to, how to stand up and how to be a resource for those that are already standing. So tonight, this town hall is a part of a three-day training, a national training for over 100 people, many of whom are in here tonight, most of whom are in here tonight. And so this is what our work is. And now I'd like to introduce you to the leader of our work, a person whose vision and guidance has brought to bear repairs of the breach. We all know and love him and appreciate so much the leadership uh, and his willingness to walk hand in hand with us as we change the state and as we change this country. So I'd like to present Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. Thank you, Thank you. Welcome. We is the most important word in the justice vocabulary. The issue is not what I can do, but what we can do. When we stand together, we pray together, we litigate together, sometimes we go to jail together, but most of all, we never give up on being together. So tonight, I wanna to welcome you here, and I wanna start by simply saying, forward together. I want you to give your hand to Miss Roz Pellis, who is the Executive Director of Repairs of the Breach, a North Carolina girl, home girl, who is bringing tremendous uh, blessings and gifts to this work. I want us one more time to acknowledge the President of St. Augustine's. Did I say that right? St. Augustine's. My friend, Dr. Everett Ward, who is also the national president of our beloved fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. So I want to honor that tonight. He and I had the same mentor, and that is E.V. Wilkins, who has gone on to be with the Lord. He was a great fighter for justice, 
and his legacy continues in so many people throughout North Carolina. To the students and faculty here at St. Augustine's, we thank you. And you know, while I graduated from North Carolina Central, my roots, as they would say in the country, are right here at St. Augustine's. My father went to St. Augustine's in the 1930s. And because of this conversation tonight, I want to explain it because it fits. My father graduated valedictorian from high school, but he could not go to UNC or, North, or NC State, not because he wasn't gifted, but because it was a time of segregation. He graduated valedictorian in Williamston, North Carolina, in a black school there, E.J. Hayes. Also, he was poor, came from a family farm. His grandmother, however, would pick extra cotton and would not allow him to pick cotton because she made him stay in school. So she took on the extra burden of picking cotton. Pick, in other words, she picked his amount. The only school he could go to was Elizabeth City State University. But at that time, Elizabeth City State University was a two-year school. My father went to Elizabeth City State. He was then drafted into the Navy. He was drafted into the Navy uh, to teach incoming black recruits, because this was before the armed services were desegregated. So he was drafted to give first class blood for second class citizenship. Now, interestingly, my, the blood that runs through my DA, DNA is white, Tuscarawan, and African American, which is the character of a lot of the blood in eastern North Carolina, if the truth be told. My father um, went in the Navy, and because of some racist elements in the Navy, uh, one officer, as he told me, wanted him not to do what he was supposed to do, train incoming recruits. But he said somebody like him, who was a N-word, should be empty in his bedpan. It was Dr. Trigg who was the president of St. Augustine's College that found out about what was happening. And Dr. Trigg had some relationships with some of the po political powers of that day and made some calls and helped to make sure that my father was able to do the work he was recruited to do. And when he came out of the service, he returned here to finish his four-year degree in science. Um, and graduated at the top of his class. But once again, even though he wanted to go to medical school, he could not go to medical school, even though he had the grades. He didn't have the money. And so he went to Georgia to teach, have coached the basketball team. And then later on, uh, he went to CTS in the Midwest and earned a degree in theology and a, a master's degree in, in um, sociology, began to work toward his doctorate. And then he received a call from E.V. Wilkins. And the call was, we know that you're in the Midwest. We know that you're in a community that has tried to move toward some desegregation. But our schools in North Carolina are still segregated. Now this is 12 years after Brown. This is 1966, and many schools districts in North Carolina didn't even begin to really move toward desegregation until after the Swan case in the 1970s. And my father, Evie Wilkins, said, I know you can escape this, but will you come back home? My father decided I had been born in 1963, August 30th, 1963, and he and my mother had to make a decision. Do we take our only child back into the South and enter him into segregated public schools and be a part of the transformation of the South? Or do we stay in Indiana, stay in the Midwest? My parents made that decision that they would come back and they would enter their only child into segregated kindergarten. 
that my father with his two master's degrees would go to work at Union School in Roper, segregated. My mother would go to work as a secretary for E.V. Wilkins in the segregated school so that they could be a part of working with black and white teachers who would meet clandestine at Elizabeth City State University. They would meet undercover, preparing for desegregation. My mother, my father became one of the first science teachers to desegregate the high school. I went into grade school after spending kindergarten and first grade in segregated schools. And my mother integrated the office pool at the former white high school in Plymouth, North Carolina, and still gets up every morning at six o'clock to go to work to the school that she deseg helped to desegregate nearly 50 years ago. She's 83 years old. And she gets up every morning and goes to work. So I asked her one day, Mama, why do you do that? She says, when I came, they didn't want me. Now I'm going to stay till I get ready to leave. <laughs> but she also told me one day, looking at the current situation that we're in, she said, with tears in her eyes, I never thought I'd have a child in 63, two days after the march in Washington, and the country would still be wrestling with voting rights and living wages and health care, and that we'd still be in a situation where the, that we're resegregating public schools faster now than in some ways we were in the late 1970s. And with a tear in her eye, as sometimes if you know about our African-American queens, it's not when tears are coming out of both eyes, but when that one tear comes out of that right eye. It means not that they're getting weak, but they're very serious. And with that one tear coming out of her right eye, she said, I didn't think that you would have to be fighting, but you better. Because too many paid too much for us to go back now. So we're here tonight. We're here tonight at St. Augustine's College, that college named after one of the first African scholars of the Christian church, St. Augustine of Hippo, who was born in Africa, who helped to write the early theology that the, the church, the Catholic church, and Protestant churches pay attention to. Here we are. After having an election this year full of hate and racism and classism and homophobia and xenophobia, and yet, a, 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 a political year that ended with an election, and after that election, Steve Bannon was put in the White House, a white nationalist. But then you look at it, if you know history, you know that wasn't, that's not the first time that white supremacy has had an impact on our elections. <laughs> It's not the first time we've elected someone who purported racist <laughs> at attitudes and policies. 2016 or 17, Bannon is in the White House. 1917, Birth of a Nation was in the Oval of Office. The most racist movie ever produced by someone from this state, produced by a former legislator from Cleveland County, Birth of a Nation sought to argue that white and black people working together in the Reconstruction was a curse on America, and that uh, white supremacy ought to rule and that the Klan ought to be celebrated, and any policies that were passed during Reconstruction should be turned back. So America has always struggled with what right, one writer called America's original sin of racism and the original sin of classism because at the same time that African Americans were denied their rights under the constitutions and the constitution and treated like or not treated legally made property poor white folk without land men were denied the right to vote too how do we have this grown up conversation about race 
1967, Dr. King, speaking from Riverside Church, said that we needed a radical revolution of values. He said that until we deal with the issues of racism, class, and the materialism, that America was morally bankrupt. But he was speaking about Vietnam, and some people said, no, no, you're supposed to deal with civil rights. That's the race stuff. And Dr. King said, no, within, it's all connected, militarism, classism, and racism. And you cannot extricate one from the other, but you have to deal with them simultaneously and together. He was shot exactly one year after that speech as he was working on the Poor People's Campaign to bring peop white people together from Appalachia, black people together from, with black people from the Delta, and Latinos who were out in the farms and others in the urban areas. And he was killed this year with the Kairos Center, and Liz Theo Harris and Repairs of the Breach. We're, going, we're announcing that we're going to not remember the Poor People's Campaign, but re-engage a national moral revival, Poor People's Poor Children's Campaign and this, in this country to shift this narrative. This is not merely a season for tweeting. This is a season for transformation. And on April the 2nd, I will be preaching at Riverside in the honor of that 50th anniversary, but more so talking about what we must do now. Lastly, in 1968, Kevin Phillips told Richard Nixon, I know how you can win in America. He said, all you gotta do is find out who hates who. And he said, let's come up with a plan that can pit white people in the South against black people in the South who really need to be allies. Let's figure out a plan that we can pit poor whites and poor blacks and poor Latinos against one another. He said that and they called it the white Southern strategy. Nixon implemented it and won barely the first time by big margins the second time. Ronald Reagan used it to perfection in the 1980s, connected it with the moral majority and Reagan wins a landslide and the policies that he ended up implementing hurt the very people that voted for him. But Kevin Phillips said this, and it's documented and footnoted. He said, if we do this right, we can make the Republican Party the party of whites in the South, the Democratic Party the party of blacks. We can pit people against each other. Now, some people didn't believe it until Lee Atwater was doing an interview. And in that Lee Atwater interview, Lee Atwater from South Carolina, the home of Strom Thurmond, was asked the question, what did you do? And he said, on tape, he said, we came up with a way to talk about race without sounding racist. He said, we came up with a plan. And the way we would talk about racism, we would talk about entitlement reform and cuts, states' rights, forced busing. Then he said, we would even get more generic and talk about tax cuts. He said, but within that framework, we would pass policies. And those policies would hurt blacks the most, but would also make many whites think that blacks were their problem and the cause of their problems, and thereby split the very communities that need to be allies in order to transform and continue to move us toward being a more perfect nation. We're seeing that at work today. And that's why we thought, in the midst of all of this national reality that has deep and historical roots in the games that people play on the minds of people, and they continue to poison the political atmosphere with these code words and codings and policies to divide the very people that ought to be together. If you lay a map out and, that, and, and ask of that map, show me all the states with high level of poverty. Show me all the states with that, that don't have a living wage. Show me all of the states that have pushed, um, have denied Medicaid expansion. And then show me all the states where you've had racist voter suppression and gerrymandering. 
and then show me all the states where you have this brand of white evangelicalism that never says a word about racism and injustice and health care, but suggests the only things we ought to be concerned about is attacking gay people, being against abortion, being for prayer in the school, being for property rights, and being for gun rights. And when you overlay those maps, they're all the same states. What? And if we don't unpack how this, this, this poisonous brew is being mixed and injected into the veins of our political system, then it undermines the ability for us to build fusion relationships like this room tonight here in a historically black college, but a room of great diversity, which is the only thing that's going to transform our politics. So we wanted to have a grown-up conversation about race, class, and poverty, and that's why we're hosting this. This conversation is, is not about somebody calling you the N-word. We know that's racist. It's not about David Duke. This conversation is to go deeper, to help us really understand what we mean when we say systemic racism, systemic classism. What is the connection between the attacks on the Latino community. Why did a candidate say Mexicans and not Latinos in general? <laughs> Why? What code words are being used and how are they used to divide the very communities that need to be together? Now to help with this conversation, there's no way in the world we could do it alone. So I want to ask them to stand as I call their name first. Dr. Eduardo Manilia Silva, professor of sociology at Duke University and president-elect for both the Southern Sociological Society and the American Sociological Association and author of Racism Without Races. I think he has something to say. <laughs> then we have the Reverend Claudia Del Cruz who is an adjunct professor at, Saint, at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and um, popular, the Popular Education Project and the New Poor People's Campaign. Would you stand? That's true. She, she's a powerful sister. Then we have the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-director of the Kairos Center for Religion, Rights and Social Justice, founder, coordinator of the Poverty Initiative and the New Poor People's Campaign. And she is a scholar in New Testament studies. We have Dr. Thomas Ferguson. He's an economist, professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, director of research at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, long-time contributing editor to The Nation and a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Political, e of Political Economy and author of Golden Rule and the co-author of Right Turn. Would you welcome Dr. Ferguson? <laughs> then we have Michelle Lanier, who's the executive director of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission who is also a folklorist and an educator. Would we welcome her tonight? And tonight we're blessed. They don't normally allow two presidents to fly on Air Force One at the same time. Well, something, unless one's retired. So I guess that can happen tonight because we have a former president of Bennett College and a labor economist, a noted author and commenter and a sister that will tell it like it is, T-I-S, none other than the, I also almost said the Jack Lake Reverend, Dr. <laughs> Julianne Malvo. <laughs> so let's have a conversation. And you will have an opportunity to write some questions and send them up uh, that we will pick at the end. But we want to start, and I think in that order, is that right? The order I just called off? With Dr. Malvo going last, this, this first cross? So, Dr. Silva, um, it, from your perspective, from your level of research, give us a three-minute opening statement on 
what you see is necessary, what must we understand if we're going to have a grown-up conversation about race and class and justice in America in the 21st century? Good evening. Can you hear me? So we cannot have a grown-up conversation on race and class in America until we begin challenging two dominant narratives. The first one is, and we're familiar with this storyline, is that the problem of racism is limited to poor, uneducated, southern whites. This narrative was central to explain, supposedly, Trump's victory, even though the data is clear. Most whites voted for Trump, okay? And on top of that, let's also be critical of those who believe that voting for Hillary means you are beyond race, yeah? I think that those who voted for Hillary, <laughs> most of them, are differently racialized, so they also have racial perspectives, yeah? So what is the problem with this alternative, with this perspective, with this narrative? First, it assumes that the problem of racism is limited to some individuals, and it's not a collective, systemic, or structural problem. Second, it misses the fact that although we still have the old-fashioned racial discourse of the past out there, a new, killing me softly version of prejudice has emerged that I call in my work colorblind racism. And lastly, it leads us into the wrong political path. Politics is about adding people, not subtracting. We cannot do the change that we need in terms of race and class by excluding the white majority, period. The second narrative out there, which I find troublesome, and this one is of more recent origin, is this idea that we have to give sort of blanket empathy to poor whites because they, in particular in this election, they were just expressing their class anxieties, yeah? And obviously I want to be empathetic to everyone suffering, but if we're going to talk about suffering, let's talk about the suffering of black and brown folks. We have been suffering for a long, long time. So when white folks have a cold, we have pneumonia. So please, give me a break, you know. Secondly, um, so the anxieties that uh, white, poor whites and white workers express are not just class-based. Their subjectivity is also shaped by race. So although their interests may be perceived racial interests, they are real in their consequences. So they were all happy. Uh, and emotional about Trump's comments against black folks, yeah? So, and Trump was clever in, in using uh, jargon such as law and order, and he kept talking about Chicago, all these code words for white folks that he's going to discipline black folks, yeah? And he talked about a, a Muslim ban, and he talked about building a wall, and th all that is sort of perceived uh, racial interest. Now, here is the possibility and the way that I think we can get out of this quandary. The subjectivity of white folks is not perfectly produced. It has fractures and ambivalences. That's why we have had moments in American history, whether it's the Bacon Rebellion in the 17th century, or the Civil Rights Movement, or populism, or many other moments and examples of, of uh, solidarity across the, the class-race uh, uh, divide. Yeah? And this is what I think we have to begin. We unfortunately have to tear down some of these narratives in order to build a new politics that allow us to develop the necessary politics and practice on the race class front. That's it for me. Thank you. Are you taking notes? He gave us three things. We can't limit to the conversation to race or to just a small group of people. Did you get that? He talked about the killing me softly. We're gonna come back, new kind of racism. He talked about we can't give blanket empathy to white suffering and ignore suffering that's been going ongoing. And, I, and the last part, as though I mentioned 68 and those others, we can't forget, we often are taught about those powerful moments in history when black and white people and then brown came together, the fusion movement, reconstruction movement right after slavery. You had more African Americans and white people working together in the North Carolina General Assembly than you do today. And what laws did they pass? They made public education um, a, a right, not just a right. They put equal protection in the law. They opened up voting. 
They raised taxes in a way to fund those things that were good for the common, the good of the whole, and on and on and on. It came under attack, but it was fusion. Then it was fusion in the civil rights movement. Black, white, young, old, gay, straight, coming together. People forget Bayard Rustin was a labor man, was also gay, was also black. And he organized the, the, the March on Washington and helped Dr. King synthesize his thinking. And so some of these things are not even taught, which is why we have to have this grown up conversation. Thank you so much. Now we want to move to my sister, Reverend Claudia Del Cruz. If you were, and from your perspective, what's going to help us have this grown up conversation? I, I want to ask permission to share a little bit about where I'm from. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm from the South Bronx, New York City. Um, and a lot of people know New York, Times Square, you know, but the South Bronx is known as a forgotten borough in New York City. And it's, there's a reason for that. Um, it's the poorest congressional district in the United States. It has 46% of folks who live below poverty line. Hunts Point, where is where I was born and raised, um, was just recently reported to be the neighborhood that most children are not expected or wanted to live in. 59% of children in Hunts Point live in poverty. 24.5% of youth ages 16 to 19 years of age are not in school or work. And most people in this country who live in those conditions are told that, that it's their fault. Mm. Most people who live in those conditions are told that they should be ashamed because they're doing something wrong. And most people I know in that community who have two or three jobs and a hustle um, are the hardest working people that I've ever met. And so it's a lie, right? We've been lied to. Another interesting fact about the South Bronx is an Afro-Caribbean community. Most of the people who live there are from the islands. I'm from the Dominican Republic. You have Haitians, Puerto Ricans, Jamaicans, um, a community that's very rich in culture and very poor economically. And it's also a very isolated community, right? Nobody wants to go to South Bronx when they visit. <laughs> New York City, who wants to go to the South Bronx? And so I was part of that community who lived in isolation. So I was 15 years old, and I was granted the opportunity to go to Chicago. I never knew that there were poor white people in this country. I got the opportunity to meet with some folks that were part of the Rainbow Coalition, and they raised the name I knew, Fred Hampton Sr. And they spoke about the Black Panthers, the Rainbow Coalition, and the Young Lords, and how they came together, understanding that one of the biggest issues that is not spoken about, and if you do dare to speak about it, you might end up dead, is class. Mm. <laughs> okay? Um, Fred Hampton was 21 years old when he was murdered in his house because he dared to talk about cross-racial organizing around street organizations, which is another threat in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not of the past, let's think of Ferguson and Baltimore, when young black people who have lost everything stand up to this nation and demand radical systematic change. Um, and so it was in that experience that I understood that, yeah, as race has been an integral um, and formative part of the US history, it's intrinsically connected <laughs> to the economic and constitutional foundations of our society. And it is not until we are able to understand that, you know, there's this uh, Olympics of oppression that takes place. Mm -hmm. um, who's more oppressed? You know, black, black folks been more oppressed than Latinos, Latinos been more oppressed than whites, LGBTQ folks have been more oppressed than women, women have been more oppressed than men. Yes, we've been oppressed. And, you know, interestingly enough, the oppressor cannot oppress us all in the same way. Because what would happen if they oppressed us in the same way? There's more an opportunity of unity. <laughs> we wouldn't have to fight each other. That's a very, very, very intelligent way 
and a very intelligent strategy to keep us divided. Mm -hmm. And so that has been the case with race. If we look at the economic base of slavery, who are the, who are the overseers? They were not the landowners. Mm -hmm. They were also working class people. Okay? And it took me a while to understand that. It took me traveling and leaving my city to understand that. And, and not a lot of the time do we have the opportunity to engage in conversations across race, across issues, because it's not intent, I mean, it's not um, coincidental, it's very intentional. They keep us busy in our silos. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like for us to be able to have a serious and adult conversation, we need to understand that these things are very intentional. Mm -hmm. And who benefits from these, these things? I think also in terms of like coming from the South Bronx, which is a primarily immigrant community, mm -hmm. how does race play into the immigrant communities? We have been taught to hate ourselves and look at the colonizers, which were Spain, Spaniards, French, Dutch, as what we aspire to be. And when we come here, a lot of the times we aspire to be like the gringos. You know who the gringos are? <laughs> and we're not talking about the gringos who are working class. We're talking about the wealthy white men, okay? And so we fight amongst the immigrant community about who's gonna get that batch. And so we also do not assume ourselves, and I say that as a black Latina, we don't assume our blackness. And I think that that's, that's also an issue and a point of division of of a working class. And so the approach to our work cannot be which oppression are we supporting mm -hmm. or wanting to overcome. <laughs> that, that shouldn't be the agenda. The agenda should be an anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist. Anything and everything that exploits, that dehumanizes, that demoralizes, that makes a human being feel less than human is something that we should fight against. And it's not, yeah. and as, the, and as the, the brother was sharing earlier, the idea that it's individual is, it's not individual, it's systematic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's systematic. Racism exists because there is such a system as white supremacy. And so we need to acknowledge that. But white supremacy does not act alone. It feeds off capitalism, and so does like capitalism feed off white supremacy. And so if we're serious about these things, we need to take all these things into consideration in our work. Great. Thank you so much. You all hear the depth of these conversations, the beginning? And you know, I was thinking about it as you talked about it. How many of you saw Free State Jones? And you saw how, when, the, when the poor whites figured out that they were being used to fight the Civil War by the planters who made rules that, so that their, their wealthy children didn't have to go to war. And then afterwards, when they began to hook up, they became a powerful force. And one of the things in the Moral Monday movement and Moral Revival we talk about is an anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor, transformative. And oftentimes I get asked the question, well, which one of your issues is most important in all of them? They say, well, why are you standing up for HB2? It's just about the transgender. No, it's actually an anti-workers bill, an anti-access to the court bill. And the root, root of it is the same kind of thinking that goes into racism against black people. And the, some, some people are subhuman, do not deserve the same rights. We have to cut through. Now, I just want you all to know that I'm, I barely made it here today because you talk about what will happen if you organize. The systems hate it so much today that when we went over just to have a, pro, a, a press conference to say we were coming next Tuesday, white, black, Latino, gay and straight, Muslim, Christian, uh, Jews and others, even people that may not be religious faith but are people that believe in the, a moral arc of the universe, they now tell us we can't even have a press conference inside of the General Assembly in any of the space or we can be arrested. Somebody just filed a bill to charge protesters with economic terrorism and four, five members of the General Assembly, now I know y'all are watching the tweets, but you better watch what's happening right here in North Carolina. Four members of the General Assembly have filed an, a, a pro-succession bill. 
and they want to put on the ballot in 2018 to give North Carolinians the ability to vote, to, to vote if they, to take the constitutional uh, language that says we can never succeed out of the Constitution. And I could go on and on. And also they're trying to pull a coup d'etat in the courts. Uh, so we have, this is why we have to, and I like what she said, systemic, systematic racism. All right. Reverend Dr. Preacher, Liz Theo Harris, you're in Sunday school, you're preaching in the sermon, and you're trying to help people begin, have a, a grown-up conversation, grown folks business. How would you open that, that sermon? Yeah, so I, I think um, there's a number of places where we have to start. I mean, one is a, a broader definition of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, when we talk about the question of poverty, one in two people in the United States are living in or near poverty. Um, so we're not talking about some group of isolated people over there. We're not talking about people that just live in cities. We're not talking about people that just live in rural areas. And I think, so I think it's really important for us to actually talk, like, to look at the data, to look at the reality, and to disaggregate who's being impacted by, by these problems. Um, I think we also have to approach it theologically. Um, that map that you were talking about, Reverend Barber, of, of the states that have low education rates, the states that have high pollution rates, the states that have uh, the suppression of voting rights, many of those uh, states have the highest per capita religious institutions in them. Mm. And so they clearly have a theology that justifies that kind of inequality. They have a theology that says that the poor are sinners who are uh, at, and not at right with God and deserve to be in the situations that they're in, and that the people that have beautiful houses and wonderful health care and their kids are going to the best schools, that they have been blessed by God to drive those nice cars. And, and that theology is anathema. No, uh, that's right. Uh, it, and it is, it is damaging and damning the vast majority of our people, of our children, to a hell here on earth. And, and, and that, we have to talk in those terms. We have to look at it theologically. When, when you look at a passage like Matthew 25 that folks, you know, quote a lot when we're talking about the problems of, of poverty and racism, um, that, you know, you who did the least to... To, to one of these did, the, did the, this to me. Mm -hmm. Well, the least of, of these is most of us. Uh, uh, we're, and, and, and we have a power that, that we have to tap into and work across and build this fusion movement. Um, and I think the, the last part of the story, I mean, so one is, is defining these issues and inequalities as broadly as we can. Um, two is looking at them theologically, and three is actually looking at what folks are doing in their communities and how people are coming across these divisions and working across these divisions already. In, in the work I, I come from of uh, you know, being a theologian, being a pastor, but also being an anti-poverty activist, uh, we talk about the fight of the, the, the plight of the poor um, and, and oppressed, um, the problems that we're seeing. We talk about the fight, the fight of the poor, and we talk about the insight of the poor and oppressed. And, and we have to look at all of these. And in communities you know, gathered here at this, uh, this town hall that are coming to this and pull this training, um, there are folks from all over the country who are, are working across racial lines, geographic lines, gender lines, religious lines, trying to build a better world, a world without racism and poverty. And, and I think we have to look at those experiences from history and, and that are going on today and see what can be done. Mm -hmm. So I think later on in the program, you're probably going to take issue when I say that we really shouldn't be focused on any of this stuff because the poor are going to be with you always. And that's just, you, you might, I'm going to say that and see if that bothers you a little bit. <laughs> I'm just going, I'm, I'm going to play that, play the, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. How about that? All right. Let's give her a hand. Now, I visited in Detroit the New School of um, Economics and uh, had a chance to meet brothers and sisters like 
Dr. Tom Ferguson, uh, who look at these numbers and look at economics. And you know, oftentimes, as, as I told you early on, um, Lee Atwater said if we have an economic conversation, we can hide the racism because it wasn't sound like, but we invited Dr. Ter Thomas Ferguson here, and I want to ask him, you, you are beginning a, a, a research paper, and you got to do this opening thesis connecting the issues of economics and race to have it in a grown-up way. Let's say you're going to be the footnoter for the Moral Monday movement, and you're going to help us shape policy uh, or the Moral Revival movement. Help us today, Dr. Ferguson, from an economist's perspective. Okay, well, I, I accept the challenge, I guess. Oh, I'd okay. I'm very happy to be a footnote to you, Dr. Bob. <laughs> uh, I, I should Bring him up just a little bit. Bring that mic up some. This, yeah, this is just, just a bit of a challenge coming to St. Augustine because um, I normally try to start anything I'd say to an audience with a joke. Now, St. Augustine <coughs> is not easy to find humor in. I, I know of only one. I've been telling people for the last eh, longer, all right, I'll say it, 30 years, that he's actually the patron saint of the modern Democratic Party politicians. When he, his, remember his prayer, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, if we want to have... Some of us also pray that same okay. prayer every day I did. <laughs> I do it every time I see chocolate cake. Lord, make me pure. <laughs> But not yet. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we want to have, uh, I think, an adult conversation about race and class, I think we have to start with the reality that American politics is, a, is an amazingly money-driven system. I, I don't know, were they able to do my one slide or not? Um, there, was, there was some hope. I'll this. check. All right, I, will just, I, I, I will just do this without a slide then. Um, my, I had a couple colleagues of mine, uh, Ji Chen and Paul Jorgensen and I, spent a long time sifting through campaign finance totals, which is much harder to do than you could imagine because it's not just the Federal Election Commission. You got the IRS, which collects information on something called 527s and things like that. So we build up what uh, were thought pretty much, I think, close, not all money in politics, but all the reported stuff. And here's the sort of amazing thing. You know, when I was a kid, people would say to me, well, you know all these people who lose elections after they've spent more money, and every time, you know, there was uh, the Bush, the last member of the Bush family blew, what, 100 million and got nothing for it, uh, running Jeb. Um, in fact, when you study this statistically and look at House and Senate races, it turns out we can predict 80% of the outcomes in those races by knowing just one thing, the amount of money they spent. When hmm. you do this as a graph, it's absolutely stunning. Um, but so, my, so that's my first point. This, this system is really hugely money-driven to a degree that, look, no newspaper is going to tell you this. Uh, none. Um, but it's true, all right? And second thing is the world is changing and I'm not trying to tell you it's all for the better. Um, indeed, I used to be accused of demoralizing people uh, by sort of painting uh, sort of what I thought was going on, although I actually, for the first time in my life, I'm not claiming to see light at the end of the tunnel. There's a candle out there, though, for the first time. I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, we're living in a dual economy, meaning um, that we have a very small, high-wage sector and an enormous and growing mass of folks working at quite just enormously low wages. I mean, my, my colleague Peter Temin has, has sort of coined this term. He actually took, applied a model that was developed by W. Arthur Lewis, the first black economist to win a Nobel Prize for uh, developing countries to the U.S., but it fits. I mean, it's effectively you've got a vanishing middle class. Now, this has a couple of interesting conclusions. One is it means that enormous numbers of whites are downwardly mobile. You could see that, I think, very graphically in the last election. And it also means that young people everywhere, every race, creed, color, when they go trying to get jobs, 
they now confront uh, this sort of new model economy where nobody or hard, where the number of career uh, career based lives inside a firm has just gone way down. Um, and so people are constantly changing jobs. And you could see on both sides of the political spectrum in the last election, in the, uh, even in the Republican Party, that's certainly where some of the animus came for Trump, uh, but also for Bernie Sanders, um, the younger folks, just like this system doesn't work for the vast majority of the population anymore. It's really a basic point. Um, and that's why, that's what I say, it's a like sort of peculiar form of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the truth is, I can't tell you how the new president and the Republican Congress will get along, but I'm pretty sure they will not solve the problems that we're talking, they're not even trying uh, really to grasp those problems. Uh -huh. um, and uh, you're gonna find, just like in uh, 2016, you're, you're looking at a new political system where a huge mass of the population on both sides is very suspicious of their party establishments and they know the system doesn't work for them. They're all thrashing about right now, uh, but let's just have to sort of see what happens. This is the moment for the adult conversation about race and class. Mm. So, So Dr. Ferguson just did something we haven't heard people do. I've hearing people bemoaning and saying this is the worst we've ever seen. First of all, you should never say that because that dismisses slavery, women not having the right to vote, Jim Crow, the Holocaust, I mean, come on. But it's interesting that he just said, rather than bemoaning this moment, this is the moment. Because actually what's happening right now is just what we saw the other day with this healthcare, we'll come to it. It's people who thought they were voting to be helped. And so they're gonna have to rethink who their allies are. And we have to be open to how we work in this moment uh, of transformation. Uh, the old folk used to say in the darkest of night is when the brightest stars can be seen. Michelle, you're a folklorist and educator. You work with this whole business of North Carolina African American heritage, so you know this history like no one else. You're sitting down with a group of folk trying to get them to understand we, gotta, we have to have this grown up conversation. Where would you start? I, I think I have to begin uh, similarly to Claudia uh, and get real personal. I think race and class, and I'm going to add in sexuality, gender, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to the matrix of identity that we're exploring here. Um, I have to get real personal. I'm going to use my notes because I believe in primary sources. I got some okay, primary. all right. Prim all right. Primary sources. All right. Okay. So I'm deeply interested in um, using the tools of bearing witness, ancestral memory, cultural retentions, reclamation of spaces and narratives that may have inspired shame or pain. I'm deeply interested in the alchemy of transforming black histories into dynamic black present moments and, and black futures. I'm deeply interested and passionate about using the following as fuel for the liberation of internal and external oppressions. And some of the, the kindling for my own heart fire in this work as an educator, we have to model uh, what it looks like. We have to demonstrate what it is. So in my own personal, spiritual, emotional work, of uh, liberating myself from internal and external oppressions, I turned to some facts um, that the people of African descent have been on this land called North Carolina since the 1500s, and some of them uh, were part of Spanish explorations. So the first European language spoken on this land was Spanish. Mm. Africans desiring freedom from bondage have been ingenious. We've used all kinds of collectives. We've used landscapes ranging from swamps to woodlands. We even used the sounds of owls and our own rivers and attics, and most importantly, love to be liberated. I am fueled by the legacy of our historically black colleges and universities. They are a miracle story that still fuels me. Um,
I am fueled by the folkways of our people, swept yards that need to be swept every morning. We're sweeping the yards, the landscapes of our people. We're sweeping away oppressions. We're sweeping away indignities. We're sweeping away inhumanity. You don't sweep it once and walk away. You do it every morning. I am fueled by the folkways of the laying on of hands, of seeking ourselves in wilderness spaces, and of the sharing of the communal cooking pot. Mm. My own liberation um, comes from the stories of Dovey May, Johnson, Roundtree, Golden Franks. I'm gonna pour these names over you like a litany and I hope that you'll jot them down and do your own research, but Dovey May, Johnson, Roundtree, and Golden Franks, and Nina Simone, and mm. Charlotte Hawkins Brown, and Selma Burke, if you got a dime in your pocket. Um, Ella Baker, David Walker, who some believe inspired Nat Turner's rebellion. John Chavis, Abraham Galloway and his accompanist uh, in Newburn, Mary Ann Starkey, and Harriet Jacobs, who went from addict to activist, and my Aunt Effie Year again. Mm. And the 125 plus African American men who served in the Reconstruction Era legislature here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the first, in the first entering class of St. Augustine's normal school, Anna Julia Cooper, who went from slave to Sorbonne. Robert F. Williams. Mm. Polly Murray, brilliant, same gender loving, law scholar, priest, saint, poet, human rights champion, and her dear friend, Bayard Rustin, who we heard of, same gender loving, freedom fighter, one of the architects of the March on Washington, who spent 22 days on a chain gang mm -hmm. here in North Carolina for fighting for freedom. I turn back to these legacies because it fuels me um, into a spirit of liberation. It undermines and dismantles any potential uh, internalized white supremacy that can get inside uh, like a disease. I'm grown brave by the multiracial Lumbee Indian-led Lowry gang who fought like mighty and righteous warriors against the disease of white supremacy during the American Civil War. One tradition I want to tell you all about that I, that I see, many of these traditions have resonances and echoes into today, but one that I think that you need to know about is that January 1st was the beginning of the slaveocracy econ economic year. January 1st. And so when we think about people staying up on New Year's Eve doing a watch night service, on December 31st, you might have been watching in uh, 1862 for the culmination of what you had heard about with this thing called the Emancipation Proclamation. You might have been staying up watching for that, but if it was 1842, January 1st meant the potential that your loved one might be leased away. Mm. Leased. It was leasing day. It was called leasing day. If you're an enslaved person, your loved one could be rented like we rent cars. Leasing day. So watch night might have been a time of praying that your loved one was not sent off for two years to go into a pine forest in North Carolina where they may not come back. Or you might be praying for the loved one who was sent to be a midwife in another county that she would return to you. That leasing day tradition has echoes and resonances in today with the corporatization of our prison economy, which is mm. our new slave industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, in, where incarcerated people, the labor of incarcerated people can be leased, can be purchased to the highest bidder. This is not new. Mm. We have to know our history and we have to take hold of the spirit of Harriet Jacobs, who was an abolitionist. And we have to take hold of the spirit of Pauli Murray. And we have to take hold of the spirit of Abraham Galloway, who was brave enough 
to take his formerly enslaved body and step into the state capitol here in Raleigh and serve as a senator, as a black man in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. So we have to take hold of it and we have to allow it to kindle in us a fire that requires that we be treated as human beings. Yeah. I could not help but think when you talked about people being leased and rented, rent and, 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 and they could be rented, and then think about how some people feel as though poor people shouldn't have ownership, even today, of homes, and how, of all people, Richard Nixon said it is actually possible for a system to be so racist, as a quote I, I read, I'm paraphrasing what he said, that somebody might not o overtly commit to it but the system, we used to call it demand. <laughs> so demand is doing it. That was a way of saying it's so in the system that it's operative and people participate in it without even realizing they're participating in it until you point out to them that they're participating in it. And so that this notion that some people aren't even of ownership value, they only should have rental houses or rental property. You know, it, it's, a, it's a heavy, um, consideration what you what you you just raised for us but then that hope in there I think you mentioned white abolitionists alongside black civil rights civil workers and I'm thinking about you know uh, Thoreau and Levi Coffin yeah and when Th then Thoreau said they you know his friend Ralph Raldo Emerson asked him one day why was he in jail engaged in civil disobedience you know against slavery and against certain kinds of taxes and he asked Emerson well why aren't you in jail and then somebody said, well, he said, Mr. Thoreau, and this is a white guy saying, we, we, you know, that's why when we say white supremacy, we got to separate that from meaning white people, yeah. right? Because we, we have some black folk today, but more participatory than, in white supremacy than, than some of my white brothers and sisters that I've been to jail with. But, but Thoreau said, they asked him, would he repent? He said, nope. <laughs> he said, the only thing I'm going to repent of is for not asking sooner what demon possessed me to be so quiet in the face of so much injustice. Yeah. Dr. Malvo, you are a writer, an author, a labor economist, a friend, a sister gal, as they would say, my president, my daughter's president. If you were starting an article, you, you're writing, you know, a major article, the whole world's going to read. That's a pretty tall one, which you do anyway. How would you start this framing, this conversation, this grown-up conversation about race and class? Well, first of all, Reverend Barber, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always good to be with you. I'd do anything for this brother, anything. And all y'all in North Carolina are very blessed to have him. Brother President, I hope you're still here. But if he isn't in your absence, so there you are. Hey, now. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your hospitality. Always good to be on your campus. And it looks lovely. Makes me a little nostalgic to be back on an HBCU campus. Want to thank my fellow panelists, but especially my sister. Such a lyrical statement. Mm -hmm. Such a lyrical statement, almost like poetry and water spilling over. So I really appreciated that. I almost closed my eyes just to savor, mm. especially when you talked about Anna Julia Cooper, of course, an alum of St. Augustine's University and a sister, first black woman, well, she was the fourth black woman to get a doctorate, uh, the first to get one from the Sorbonne, and just an amazing woman who lived to be, I think, 103, 100 and something. But see, they don't make them like they used to. Uh, I just want to make it to 80, y'all, uh, <laughs> without getting shot, because I've talked enough stuff that somebody go get me one day. But if I were to start the conversation, I would roll back everything and start by talking about the nature of predatory capitalism. I think that that's the bottom line of how we end up with everything that we have here. Predatory capitalism, capitalism is about maximizing profits. Predatory capitalism is about taking every penny of surplus value that you create and give it to the capitalists. Of people figuring out how to exploit you, how many multiple ways to exploit you. When I was teaching econ, that was a long time ago, I used to talk about capitalism being a wolf but government regulation being the dentist. Now the dentist could either sharpen the wolf's teeth, mm, mm. make it worse, or could cap the wolf's teeth, make it better. 
What we have seen since Ronald Reagan, frankly, is a wolf that has had their teeth sharpened and sharpened and sharpened and only infrequently kept. And the capping after the sharpening sometimes doesn't work. If you have bad teeth, you know that. You know, then you just can't cap bad teeth. You gotta pull those suckers out. And so if we look at predatory capitalism, this is the organizing principle of our economy. Now the question is, who's gonna be the winner and who's gonna be the loser? If we go back to our American history, go back to the 16, 19, uh, it, black people and industrial service were treated the same way. Then at a point in time, because we could be differentiated by our color, we then became enslaved. You can go back into Virginia law and look at that 16, really it's like a 16, 20, 16, 40 period where you begin to get regulation that differentiated by race. You also had a constitution who only provided voting power to people who had property. So again, this is about predatory capitalism. Only those who had, quote, skin in the game, we might say white skin in the game, uh, because we, of course, were defined as three-fifths of people. So only those who had some stake in the capitalist system were able to benefit with political participation. So thus, uh, Brother Ferguson's comments about how much it costs to play, mm. to, pl to play in the political system, these are the, it's so right on time, especially when you look at who purchased 45. Because he didn't, I, I tried not to use his name because it's just, I just try not to. 45. 45. Mm -hmm. Either that or an orange orangutan. But, um, <laughs> but somebody told me that that was unkind to orangutans. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, so we have a system that worships capital. That literally puts capital on top of everything else. On top of labor. You know, on top of land. Because land can be appropriated often for the purpose of capital exploitation. Mm -hmm. you no, know, 45 says he wants to build a fence. He does not understand that he cannot build a fence, that there are several thousand parcels of private property that he would have to put the fence on. One little lady down in Texas played with them for years and ended up getting $56,000. Uh, they still so they put the fence there, but she still has access to her property. They have to put a complex uh, code so she can open the fence to go back and forth between her property. Now, multiply that by 1,000 people. Is this really practical? Is this how we want to spend our time? Combining that with the 37% cut in the Coast Guard. So we're saying one border is more important than the other border. I mean, good for our Haitian brothers and sisters. They can swim over here now. I mean, if we're gonna cut the Coast Guard, but I mean, they really can't, but um, they can try. Um, but in any case, what we're seeing is, is, is basically the worship, again, of capital. And so many of us, the worship of capital combined with the total indifference to the human spirit, and no sense of how much is enough. And so that's why regulators go in. Now you have regulators who go in for two reasons, again. One reason, one set of reasons are economic reasons. And the other set of reasons are political reasons and moral reasons. Because I always wonder about people who say they want people to have free choice, but they don't want me to choose what I do with my body. In other words, I don't know where you stand. I'm sitting here with the Rev, and he's not going to hit me upside my head, I pray. Um, but I don't know where you stand with a woman's right to choose, but that's what it, if you don't like abortion, guess what? Don't have one. It is not mandated. Right. Just like. You know, if you don't like gay marriage, don't marry a gay person. Right. You know, and stay out the gay bars. It's real simple. But, we, but when we see regulators, see, it is a myth that 45 and his minions are going to come in and get rid of all government regulation. They're going to get rid of the government regulation that empowers people, that preserves rivers, that protects our environment. That's the regulation they want to get rid of, not all regulation. They want to get rid of regulation that provides and protects your right to organize. Mm -hmm. And the only way that individual workers get any power in a predatory capitalistic system is through organizing. 
You, one person, cannot go and say, I want more money. Well, you can, but the likelihood is mixed, if not low. But when you go together, but unions now represent less than 12% of our, our working population. And under President Obama, the Senate would not confirm members of the National Labor Relations Board. And so that board is now very weakened. Mm -hmm. 45 is going to put a bunch of anti-union people in there, and our unions are going to be further weakened. And as Reverend Barber has said, which is really important in terms of predatory capitalism, protests cost these people money. Right. This is why, this is why they want to talk about, I saw something the other day, you talked about economic terrorism. There was a, some state has something called felony protesting. So just the act of protesting then becomes a felony. Now, you know, um, some people of color don't mind going to jail for misdemeanors. You know? Right. I mean, you can get a lot of misdemeanors, you don't mind going to jail for those, but felonies are deal breakers, especially for people of color. Mm. And so this is going to change, perhaps, the complexion of protesting. The reason why it's important to look at predatory capitalism as a backdrop to this conversation is because while much of my work and many of us have focused on basically race and class, predatory capitalism allows for all kinds of exploitation. So it isn't just about race, it isn't just about class, some of it is about intersectionality, some of it is about those who are differently abled, where for, as an example, an African-American woman earns about 63% on a dollar, 63 cents on a dollar that a white man earns, but a disabled African-American woman earns 12 cents. Ooh. 12 cents on a dollar for a white man. So, so our differently abled people, what we can see if we don't intervene, so Tom, you're right about this being a moment. What we can see if we don't intervene is to go back and look at Elizabethan England where you had workhouses and poorhouses and people arrested post-reconstruction uh, post simply for the act of being poor. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. conversation keeps coming up about what we do about poverty. When we have 10% of the African American population is not poor, it's what's called extremely poor, a half of the poverty line. So a family of four living on $12,000. The number for the overall population is about 6%, it's too high. But when we look at that kind of poverty, we're looking at people who live, live with less than $2 a day. How do you live? I mean, you can't get a sandwich for $2, you know, with less than $2 a day. So when we unpack predatory capitalism and talk about what we're prepared to do about it, then we can frame this conversation, this adult conversation about race and class in a very different way. So I refuse to believe that all Republicans are racist. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for me to believe that knowing some decent Republicans, not many, but some. Um, <laughs> but what I do believe is that many people value free markets as opposed to markets that have been intervened in. But when you talk to some of these people, many people do not want to see abject poverty, even though you say the poor may always be with us, uh, <laughs> not necessarily. She's um, gonna challenge me on I'm being, being funny about that. No, you weren't being funny. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> you, you're, trying to, you're trying to play uh, theological uh, Jeopardy. Yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, you know, people don't want to see the kind of poverty that has people, as the video shows, sleeping on the streets, standing, having um, boxes for their homes. Most people don't want to see that. Most people have bought a narrative that many of the poor are lazy. So give them, give them a day to walk in those shoes. But more importantly, have help them follow, connect the dots to say, what do you get out of her homelessness? Mm. What do you get out of their hunger? How is predatory capitalism served by the fact that the middle class is shrinking? What does it mean that our college students, some in the class of 2008, Rev, which uh, Sherelle got out just in time. The mm -hmm. class of 2008, many of them still have not recovered from the Great Recession. They graduated in eight, there were no jobs. And every year, the newer graduates were fresher, mm -hmm. newer, better. And so some of them are still, you know, failure to thrive. When you see 30-year-olds in their mama's basements, um, that's what that's about. So again, the, the first words in the sentence about how we frame this would be predatory capitalism, 
what it is, how it affects this whole issue of race and class, and who benefits from it. Because when we follow the dollars, we follow the dollars and we find that there are beneficiaries to every condition that exists in our society. As you said with the prisons, when you follow the dollars, mm -hmm. as we look at our health care system, which they're now tinkering with, mm -hmm. insurance companies are mad. That's what, I mean, Obamacare was never perfect mm -hmm. because anything that is concocted in Washington That's right. is bound to be imperfect. People often say there are two things you never want to see uh, put together, legislation and sausage because it's a very messy process. But in any case, anything concocted in Washington is bound to be imperfect. We thought we'd have time to fix it. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. is not fixing it. This is actually giving tax breaks to the wealthy. If you read that 136-page draft, it's sitting in my bed right now. I couldn't bear to bring it with me because I'm sick of it. But, um, but if you look at it, it talks about bonuses. It talks about breaks for the wealthy. So follow the money, and when you follow mm. the money, you mm. understand how predatory capitalism works and how it has exploited our differences with race and class. Yeah. I, I want particularly my young brothers and sisters and all of us to understand, we say something in the movement, the worst thing you can do is be loud and wrong, that you have to engage in this kind of thinking if you're going to engage the world and then challenge these systems. You have to really know what's going on, um, and that's so important. Um, I want you to know that, Dr. Malvo, as you were talking, I could not um, um, help but think that's why we say, when you talk about moral, the most dangerous thing, I think, to this country is when the conversation about morality, uh, so-called white evangelicals, and which, which underneath that is a lot of money, a whole lot of money. It was a, it was a book called by Kevin Cruz or how, how the pulpits, Christian pulpits of America were purchased. And they were purchased in order to change the moral conversation because they didn't want to talk about budgets as moral issues and living wages as moral issues and health as moral issues, which is how we got to most of the progressive ideas in this country. They were framed as moral issues, not just morality is not just something personal. It's really more of a critique of, of our public relationships together. And I couldn't help but think when you were saying um, uh, uh, lifting, lifting up uh, predatory capitalism that when you talk about from the beginning of this country's slavery, what, what four things, what quadrilateral was necessary to put in place the system of racism? You had to have, uh, and, and Cornel West talks about this in his book, um, Prophesied Deliverance Some, you had to have bad biology. In other words, you can determine brain size by skin color. The darker the color, the less of the brain. Number two, you had to have sick sociology. People can't be in the same space together because they will inherently turn on each other. Then you had to have uh, uh, evil economics, that the ends justify the means and profit is all that matters. So any system that makes profit, then it must be good even if it means turning people into property. And then the last part of that, you had to have a way to sway your consciousness, soothe your consciousness. So you had to have what we call heretical ontology. And that is to suggest heretically that God ontologically ordained that it be this way. Then the sick sociology is all right, the bad biology is all right, and the evil economics is all right because it's all consecrated. And, and that was around, and it still feeds much of what we see today. We've got over 4,000 people watching across the nation. I thought I'd tell you that. We're trending. We're trending. Uh, the library is full in the overhaul section, over overflow section, so hello in the library. And we are asking people to turn in their questions to the students in the aisles, uh, if you would, and they will pick them up and bring them to Now let's get to some questions. And this is going to be kind of rapid fire. We are going to end at 9.15 because we started exactly about 13 minutes late. So we're going to end at 9.15 for our audience. Let me ask this question. Um, right now we're in, and you began to do this, and you all can jump in on this. Um, we, we are in the middle of this, what I call the, the Trump-Ryan uh, take care away plan. <laughs> the Trump-Ryan take care away plan. 
But beyond just a slogan like that, I want someone to help me. Help me. I'm going to ask the question: How race and class and militarism feed into this desire, not just to overturn the ACA, which they call Obamacare. So somebody might want to even talk about that. You might want to say why it's called Obamacare as opposed to what the actual name is, and why the new thing is called the American Care Act. What, what's what's going on? Is any race class? Dynamics, I, I, you know, I want to, you know, but, but why is this not just about the Affordable Care Act, but about the attack on Medicaid, right, which wasn't always open to black people. Be it came open in the 60s, and Tim Wise says that many of the programs that were beneficial to many of our white brothers and sisters right after the war, and into, once they became racialized, they became bad or a target. Uh, and of course, a lot of people now are finding out, though, if you unpack it now, you're not just going to hurt you know, black people. But what's, is there some race? Is racism and classism and militarism have anything, Tom, and then we'll come around to do? Y'all yeah. jump in. Just, what, what, talk to me. Anybody, jump in. Got, well, you know, the health care is one-seventh of our GDP. 14% of our GDP is spent on health care. And so that's a big part of the story, mm -hmm. is that that's a huge piece of the budget. Uh, 45 wants to um, reinforce our defense militarism. He wants to increase the Department of Defense budget by, I believe it's uh, 50... Four billion. Hmm? $54, 54 yeah. billion, Something dollars, like yeah, mm -hmm. which is absurd. We don't need all that. But in any case, what we're really talking about, so the, the militarism piece is you can't have everything. Uh, Lyndon Johnson once said in the height of the war on poverty as the Vietnam War was escalating, he said that the war on poverty was like the mistress that he loved and Vietnam was like the wife he had to go home to. It's kind of indelicate, but it sounds like LBJ. Uh, but in any case, it was really just talking about the guns and butter um, syllogism that economists use, you just can't have everything. So calling it Obamacare made it easy for people who hated Obama to oppose it. Uh, Bill Maher, I think, did something where they went around and asked people, how do you feel about health care, Affordable Care Act? Oh, we love it. How do you feel about Obamacare? We don't like it. But it's the same thing. So anything that had Obama's name on it, people, there, were, there were those who were inclined to dislike. The, I think this whole 45, all of this is a vast reaction to the, president, to the very successful presidency of President Barack Obama. Can I, can I, let me push in that. Let me push in that because I know people, people clap about that. And I see Tom, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us conversing. Because it is successful. But what, I'm troubled, what I struggle with is that, for instance, in our state of North Carolina, we denied Medicaid expansion to 500,000 people. And these legislators, if you listen to them talk, and Brother, Brother Dillo, maybe you could talk about some of the code words that we are hearing, code words, triggers. Because they, 346,000 people that would have been helped in North Carolina are white. 30,000 veterans. So what's going on that you get people to vote against if, if, if this, 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 your own self-interest, what, what and I don't so much blame the people as I blame the people that are playing the people. You know, what is it that they're doing? And then, last, I want to push this question in. Theologically, how are you getting, I mean, you, if, when you, if we were talking about gay, good God, every white evangelical would be in the street. And now, we, if Jesus did anything, he set up free health clinics. <laughs> I mean, everywhere it went, no copay. You, you, you pull, you pull, just come on. So, wh where's all this quietness now? Can somebody help me? Somebody? So, Brother Danelli, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna push around. Rev, real quick, let me just oh, go say ahead, this go to ahead, you. Jump, jump. Letter to the Birmingham jail. Letter okay. from the Birmingham jail. That's okay. what white theologians need to be saying. Y'all need to invest a little money in sending that to just every single one of them because they have been shamefully and sinfully silent about the attack on the That's poor. That's right. Danilo, Tom, and then come back to Liz, and then jump in, my sister. We're going to have a conversation. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so, uh, the white working class is mad about the proposed changes in the, in the healthcare system, yeah? So, all the town halls that we have seen in the last uh, month or so, people are constantly, don't take my healthcare, and yes, uh, the, it was racialized. It was racialized as Obamacare is bad, the Affordable Care Act is good. But 45 has a trump card, and the trump card, <laughs> pun intended, and the trump card is that he can use, for example, this notion of militarism that we oppose. We have to understand that they have this perceived racial interest. They are believing that the U.S. going and bombing us, uh, 45 said, bombing the, you know what, out of ISIS, is a good thing because it's disciplining the other outside. So the job for us is to do this political work, and we, let's be honest, we have abandoned the white working class, the communities, their struggles for a long, long time. So now we have to re-engage and rework, but it's not going to be easy because they firmly believe that it's in their emotional class interest, in their race interest, again, perceived interest, to engage in militarism. So we have to do a lot of work. It's not going to be easy, but this much I know. I see a lot of whites in this audience, progressive whites. You need to be central to this re-engagement with the white working class. <laughs> Reverend Barber and many of us will do our job, but let's be honest, most likely I will not be welcome in Youngstown, Ohio, Erie, <laughs> you know, all these other, half of North Carolina, et cetera. <laughs> so we need you desperately to re-engage to stop the demonization of your brothers and sisters and the poorer uh, brothers. And you, it is central for you to be part, to become agents of change, moral, political agents of change. Let me, let me push it. I'm coming to you. I want to push this question, though, because in the Moral Monday movement, you know, I've been up in Appalachia where communities are 99% white, 89% Republican, and we're organized. I've gone with, by invitation. And first they were inviting us because they said, and they really wanted to know what was Moral Monday just an extension of the Democratic Party, or was it really about a true moral? Um, and I think it's important for, um, you know, because the moral movement, when it's just because I'm black, doesn't mean it's a black movement. It's an interracial, intersectional movement. But the question I do want to get at is, what are these co what, what did the pre what did the guy from Alabama mean when he said, if we cut, if we, if, if we need to stop, if we, if we don't repeal the Obamacare, it's going to hurt the work ethic. I'm trying, are, is there some language? I, what does this language mean, Brother, Brother Silva? What, is this, what, they, they what no kind longer, of language are you they hearing? No longer, I said it. They, okay. no, they no longer need to use the language and tropes of the past. They don't need to call us the N word or the other uh, words that they use in the past to put us in our so-called place. Yeah? So there is a new way of talking about race. And again, we demonize poor whites who tend to be more direct in the way they talk about race. But middle class, even, even Trump, even Trump uses a little bit of this colorblind nonsense when he says, I'm the least racist. I'm the least, and think, about the, think about this statement. I'm the least anti-Semitic person. You, it means what, you are like 10%, 15%? <laughs> I mean, so it's not, a, it's, the most, it's not the most effective use right. of colorblindness, but even a Trump, even the Trumpster, has to engage in this new discourse because if you are too open, then you are easily shut down. Right. You that, got to be creative. Yeah. The racial ideology needs to move on, yeah. and I think that the, this colorblind one is more effective to keep us down. Right. That's what I want us to hear in, in this audience is that we have to have almost a political Pentecost where we have to have an interpretation of the tongues in this moment because you might admit, the people will be talking racist right in your face. <laughs> and if you don't unpack this language, as, as he has so done well so in his, uh, that all the, the racist language, they said, you know, when, what the guy from South Carolina said about President Obama, he said, you lie. you lie. He didn't say you are a liar. That's a different kind of a deal. Or when he says juvenile or unfit, you know, or, destroy, or, or if we do this, we're going to destroy the work ethic among people. These are all code languages that trigger some of this stuff that's in our DNA, and we have to be able to unpack it 
and, and open it up so that we'll understand that. I was looking the other day real quickly, you know, while we ought to, we ought to move every time a, a officer of the law kills an unarmed African American uh, a, a, a person, but, it, but 3, 2,800 people die for every 500,000 people denied Medicaid expansion. Do you hear what I just said? 250,000 people a year die, and this is 2009 statistic, 250,000 people a year die because of poverty. That's more than heart attack strokes and, 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 other, and cancer. So part of us getting at this race class is beginning to, 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 to unpack it in a way that we're not just doing the sensational, which we have to, but we're, we're, we're addressing the sinister, which is not all so, so, so. Tom, talk about this Medicaid and race and class. Here, I think what the guy was from Alabama was probably implying was something about a language of entitlement which they mm. like to pretend undermines people's work incentives. Mm. That's heavily coded with race. In that sense, your original question that you posed oh, seven or 10 minutes ago, what's going on uh, with the attack on uh, Medicaid is pretty plainly, you're bashing, you're, you're, you're beating up on the poor, but then you're also trying to make it as much as possible, telling, well, everybody, uh, white folks, uh, oh, and it's, these are mostly minorities anyway. I mean, that, that does, I, I must say though, it, that I do think that it pays to look a little more critically at the Obama legacy. He okay. was, I'm not at all. That's right. I'm not at all trying to say this like it was a total failure or anything like no, that. No, 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 that's important. But it was an enormous error not to do the focus first on economic recovery. If he'd done that, we would not have Trump today, I, I, I bet, any amount of money. I know the standard line is, well, uh, he couldn't you know, move the Congress. I don't myself actually believe that was true, but never mind uh, on that. And the other side of this, this, the failure on economic policy is pretty profound. But secondly, the Affordable Care Act, you know, I supported it because it was the best you could do right. at the time. But it's a really bad bill. And the thing that is most striking to me right now as we have this debate uh, about, you know, where are we going to, how are we going to change it, repeal it? I mean, that's because that's what the debate is. It's inside the Republican Party. Notice, hardly any Democratic Party politician is coming up and making the basic case for single payer. I mean, it's, it's right. just crazy. Right, yeah. Well, it's, most of us, let, 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 let me jump in one, because I want to get Liz and come right back. I'm just messing, but, but you, you, let me, I think you raise a valid point that, and on this panel and all of us, we cannot be not critical of any politician. President Obama was once asked, where would Dr. King be if he was alive? Would he be supporting? He said, no, he would be an analyzing, criticizing, and pushing. So I agree with that. But could it be said that even the ability to deal with economics and to deal with single payer had race and class reasons behind it? Because Obama couldn't even talk about race without being shut down. You, you know, I've been doing at all the things, I've been talk, looking at, at white privilege. 45 is the perfect example of white privilege. Because he has told lies that I can't even think in public. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all hear what I'm saying? I mean, come on. No black politician, because President Obama, I mean, when President Obama tried to talk about race, he was forced to sit down with a beat cop and have a beer and apologize. So that's what we mean is a lot of people didn't criticize Obama because we were like, get a brother a break. I mean, good gracious, he can't even, he, you know, he, you, could you, President Obama did a fist bump, put his hand on his wife's dress to keep it down from coming up in the wind and all kind of stuff broke out against him and now somebody says, you know, we got a former stripper in the White House. Come on, I mean, you know, we, we have to look at this privilege that happens in this culture that actually undermines our ability to have, 
because because what do they do? What, if he talked about single payer, immediately socialist, communist. Remember, he was the Kenyan communist connection. So what I'm trying to get at is that part of the reason we can't we, we, we can't move progressive agenda until we really unpack and deal with and exercise, as you do a demon, the, a lot of this racist stuff and pull it out because it always becomes the Achilles heel that undermines it. Liz, real quick, you were going to say something theological, then I want to jump a question and get us talking. Yeah, I mean, so we'll, I, come, come back to you, Tom. I, I just think that when we're talking about the question of healthcare, there there really is no more theological issue that we because it's about life. It's about life versus death, right? And so, you know, there the the debate around uh, healthcare right now. I mean, it has it starts theologically. I mean, so I don't know if folks saw. Uh, Representative Marshall's comment, a Republican from Kansas, uh, right before they kind of put out what the new plan is going to be, where they're, they're uh, you know, cutting millions and millions and millions of people off of uh, health care. I mean, he literally quoted, uh, the poor will be with you always. Like Jesus said, he, this is what he says, just like Jesus said, the poor will always be with us in response to the question about Medicaid, which was expanded to more than 30 states. He continues, there is a group of people that just don't want health care and aren't going to take care of themselves. He adds that morally, spiritually, socially, the poor, including the homeless, just don't want health care, right? And so, and then he, he, he frames this in a theological conversation, right, where where, how have we interpreted that passage? We've interpreted that passage, it's, it becomes the most famous passage on poverty and oppression in the Bible, right? And it, it trumps all other passages about the poor. Um, we forget that Jesus talks about, I, I have been anointed to bring good news to the poor. It, we forget that that which you do to the least of these, you've done a, to, a, to me. And, and in fact, this passage, which is saying exactly the opposite of how this Republican and many other people interpret, um, it, it, you know, it, it says that poverty is inevitable, that it's willed by God. If God wanted to end poverty, God would do so. And it's therefore the people who are without health care, who are, who are without resources to feed their kids, it's their fault. Um, and, and so they don't want health care, right? I mean, but, but this passage, it, it, it says exactly the opposite, right? It's a quote, I don't know if folks know, of Deuteronomy 15, uh, which is one of the most liberatory passages. Uh, it's one of the Jubilee Sabbath passages from the Hebrew scriptures. And, and w how that starts off, there will be no needy person among you if you follow the, the laws that I'm giving to you today. And what are those laws? It's to forgive de debts. It's to release slaves, and it's to lend money out even when you know you're never going to get paid back. Right? This, and, and this is how your whole society is going to have prosperity. Um, and then it continues, like, but you all are going to be disobedient. Um, mm -hmm. You all are going to be a greedy people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the poor will be with you always. Yeah. And then he says again, so open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor. Right. So Jesus quotes this. He quotes this to his disciples and says, Rem let me remind you, we have a way, our ancestors have a way of dealing with inequality, and that's to release slaves and to forgive debts, um, to organize society amongst, a around the needs of, of those most vulnerable. And, and then he's responding to, to the people around him and to his disciples who have just said that that the, this kind of fancy ointment that was used to anoint him to become the Messiah mm -hmm. was a waste. It was a destruction. And, and what they said is that money could have, that ointment could have been sold. Um, what, what else is sold? Uh, slaves are sold. Luxury items are sold, right? Um, so that could have been sold and the proceeds of it could have been given to the poor. This is the dominant economic system that we still are living under. Selling, it's it's, yeah, it's what yeah. we were just we're yeah. talking about. So, so Jesus says, so, no, I don't want a part of that dominant economic system. I don't want to buy and sell that ointment on the same uh, luxury market as 
bodies and souls of human beings are being sold? No, that's not how you end poverty. If you do that, the poor will always be with you. But I'm gonna show you another way, a way our ancestors already knew. And that was if we organize society around the needs of everybody, then our whole society will prosper. But instead we have this interpretation yeah. of, right. of the poor will be with you always that says that the poor don't have so, health care because they don't want it, so especially poor people of color. Yeah, and so what, what I, yeah, that, give a hand. So what, what I'm hearing is, that's the same kind of interpretation that allowed where we use the scripture to support slavery and Jim Crow. It was taking little pieces of text and, 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 and not taking the whole text, which has been a common action, which is why we got to have moral leaders and religious theologians like you and economists in the same room. Tom, I want to come back because you had a piece and then I want to ask a question of my two sisters there because our time and, and are we, what we're one thing we find out you can't have the, we knew this was going to happen a full conversation about race is going to take a while but we need to begin it and Tom all I was trying to say and I hope you heard me is that a lot of us had criticisms of the Obama presidency or, or politics in general but some of the hesitation or some of the whatever was to recognize that some of what he didn't do, you can't take away all of the forces that before the man was even inaugurated, went in a room and said, we're not even gonna let one thing pass. And all of the ways in which racism, um, whether you people say, well, he didn't have to do it. Well, I, I maybe he didn't, maybe made political decisions. But when you have to renounce your pastor, even, who when you read what his pastor said was just quoting what the scripture said, there are a lot of things that God damns. That, that, I mean, there are evil, racism, injustice. He damned the fig tree. But when you have, when you, but, we, but my sister said something that I want us to hear. Taking on this system of class and race can get you killed. And we can't ever forget that. Finish your point, then I want to ask a question. My, my only comment back was I'm obviously not going to disagree that Obama right. had to contend with enormous amounts of sheer racism, mm -hmm. nor that his you. political opponents in a substantial number of cases made that an absolutely basic point. On the other hand, we can up bet, maybe get a little carried away here in the sense he won twice. He won twice. He got reelected. You'd have a much more powerful case if he'd been, you know, if he'd lost tw in 2012. I mean, and I do think, and I mean, there's a nice paper by David Autor and a string of folks recently published where they suggest that if the uh, the amount of Chinese imports have coming from the WTO accession after 2003 were half of what they were that Hillary Clinton would have won the last election fairly easily. Now, I actually think they're right on that. Mm -hmm. But the repeated failure, and it wasn't just President Obama, I mean, a whole host of people in the Democratic Party and a whole host of them in the Republican Party just ignored the, effect, the real effects of globalization oh, yeah. on the population. Oh, yeah. You can't expect to make that I'm kind coming. of thing up uh, without addressing it. Right. I mean, it really and, has to be addressed. And what's a, the point I think one must reckon with, it's really crucial, is that this process is cumulative over time. It gets worse. That's what's right. the, you've sort of hit a tipping point there. Right. Uh, and, you know, e even where we're living almost in two worlds now, where you can sit and you can, if you read the New York Times, America was like doing just fine last year. Oh, no. Um, but for a huge chunks of the population, that's just not true. When you, yeah. we realize what's going on in the spread in income distribution, it becomes very okay. easy to understand that. You've got a media that reflects one reality, or the, basically it's affluent consumers, and then there's the rest of the population. Right. That, unfortunately, is going to drive... Uh, a huge amount of mm -hmm. American politics in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I wanna, I'm going to come... To Julianne and then to you. She wanted to follow up on something. But the only thing I want to suggest, and I agree with you, but see, in a grown up conversation about race, if you simply say that if certain, not simply, if you say certain economic factors 
would have guaranteed the election of Clinton. First of all, like you said, if Clinton, even if Clinton was elected, we still have uh, millions of people without health care. We still have violence on the poor because even the Democrats didn't talk about poverty uh, and say the word poor. Uh, or race. Or race. And that's the piece I want to get to because we just went through an election. If you say that, but you cannot dismiss this election without talking about the most underreported story of the entire election, voter suppression, racial gerrymandering, 868 fewer voting sites in the black community, hundreds of thousands of people that were, were, were so to, what we want to do is say that just, we can't, because America will try to say that this past election was about economics, and it was, but it also was about reclamation and deconstruction. As Nail Painter says, it is clear Without Obama, there'd be no Trump. Mm -hmm. There'd be no Trump because Trump is obviously, she says, unsuited to hold a job, but he was suited to, to answer the call, the, the, the call and response of American racism. And that is where you have the progress, racial progress, and race and the progress of racism happening at the same time. And what we're trying to do is merge these two so that so that even Democrats now are saying, well, all we need to do now is to check, get the white working class. Well, first of all, you left 50 percent of black folk on the table. Oh, come on. <laughs> President Obama got elected by only 38 percent of the white working class. He won because he expanded the vote. We got 500,000 unregistered African-American voters in North Carolina. If you register 30% of the unregistered -Afri African-Americans in the South and, and add them to progressive whites and Latinos, you change the South. If you end racial gerrymandering, you do not have the Congress you have today. You have a different Congress that would be more open to progressive policy. So what we're saying is you gotta merge the two and talk about them, I think, unitedly. Julianne and then my sister and I got one big question Then because our time is running. Okay, I wanted to just respond to a couple of things that Tom had said about the Obama presidency. The, of course, it was, here's where I have the biggest problem. I wrote a book called Are We Better Off Race, Obama, and Public Policy. My biggest problem with President Obama is he had the Democratic Congress and Senate uh, from 2009 until 2011. He did not maximize that opportunity. Once he lost that opportunity, he really did not have as many opportunities as he might have. He got us out of the recession, and that's what we must give him credit for. But he did not use the executive order until 2015, 2016. He should have been using that executive order beginning in 2012. What we saw with the executive order, for example, is that he did attempt to deal with poverty issues. For example, federal contractors now, when 45 hasn't rescinded it yet, must pay people 10, 10 an hour. Before that, there was no requirement to do so. So I just want to, I, I mean, I agree with you that the Obama presidency was flawed, but let's be clear, the biggest flaw was those first two years when he had the legislative muscle to pass what he wanted, and he didn't do it. The second thing I wanted to say very briefly, I know we're almost out of time, I have a podcast. It's called It's Personal with Dr. J. I don't mention it to self-promote, but of course I do. Actually, I mention it because um, I did an interview with Stacey Stewart, who is the CEO of the March of Dimes. And the March of Dimes used to be about polio. Now what they do is they deal with uh, premature birth and birth defects. And we had a great conversation, downloaded on iTunes, but one of the things she said is that the right to life is really a right for a child to be able to be born without these defects. It costs 4,500 bucks to have a healthy baby. It costs 55,000 bucks to have an unhealthy baby. And if the baby has to go into neonatal intensive care, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we, we to your point about the theological underpinnings you know, of healthcare, these people spend all this time and energy talking about women's right to choose, but really the right to life is the right, That's right. to basically to be born healthy. Yeah, and somebody said we're talking about 17 million people well, 20 million people immediately will lose before this, this new Trump, Ryan, take care. But if you, 20, I think during the campaign we're taking 20 million, 3 million African Americans would lose health care, 17 million whites. And that's not even talking about all the people that we impacted because of, of um, like my daughter who has a pre existing condition. So you were wanting to jump in on this conversation. I'm going to ask one big question. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with most that has been said. I think that 
you know, we, we need to keep in mind that capitalism is a global system, right? So no longer do we have to worry or if the elite class in this country worry about their investments and the healthcare system for them is, is that, it's, it's profit. And so there's, a, there's, there's the aspect of healthcare as a business, there's the aspect of the indus industrial changes that have happened where they don't need to keep the poor healthy enough to produce anymore mm. because globally, <laughs> they have a whole bunch of cheap labor that they could tap into. And they don't have to worry about loss across the seas, right? So we need to take that into consideration. We also need to take into consideration the aspect of invasion, militarism, right? Militarism is the first step <laughs> into taking over territory, but it's also the step of taking over people <laughs> and people's governments. And that means that the investments come in, okay? Um, the factories. We wanna talk about Mexico? Let's talk about 1994 and NAFTA mm -hmm. and what Bill Clinton did, mm -hmm. right? So a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the factories that would have been in Detroit ended up in Mexico, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So no longer do we have to care about the folks in Detroit. Where is Detroit now? All right, and so we need to start making those connections because what we're talking about is people who become disposable in this country. Yeah. And so people whose health care doesn't really matter, <laughs> people whose housing doesn't really matter, and you, know, you could either get locked up or killed in the middle of the street, it's okay because you're disposable. And then it becomes normalized. That's right. The, dispo the, the normalization becomes, this disposing people becomes normalization, which is why we have to be very careful about a lot of things that are, are being, where the attempts to normalize them, not, and we also must not act as though this is recent. It's not, it's a part of our R ancient right. past. Um, if you go to Somerset Place State Historic Site and you know, out toward the Outer Banks, the thing that may strike you the most is these very old canals um, from the 1700s, the draining of the swamps. They were dug by what we believe were Igbo people who were kidnapped from Nigeria, what is now Nigeria, and their bodies were absolutely treated as disposable. They were digging those canals by hand. It was so, such a brutal And the purpose of those canals. And the canals was so that more access to more land, to more Economics. plantation building, to more right. naval stores, to stri stripping the, the woods of turpentine, tar, and pitch, it, it was all fueled by disposable human bodies. They were th literally throwing bodies over the canals every morning, not burying them, and it be became so brutal, and I'm not trying to horrify people, but y'all need to know this is a part of our, the history of our nation. It became so brutal that they were caging the enslaved Africans and making them to labor in cages. That was in, that was what, Mississippi? Somewhere? No, this is here. Not in not North Yes, Carolina. sir. North Carolina? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so race was used to identify disposable bodies yes. to make profit. Yes. Connection. And it became, and you were disposable until right. the transatlantic slave trade became illegal. And when it became illegal, then it was like, oh, well, we don't want to dispose of them because we need them to be breeding each other for, for mm -hmm. more labor. So, so part of what you all are arguing then is that within this context, when people say things, well, you have access to, okay, I'm, well, somebody says, I got access to a Rolls Royce, doesn't mean I can buy one. But that th within the mindset, whether it's said overtly or not, some people are still seen as disposable. And it's said to us, says Dr. Silver, but we may not hear it because of the language, the code language. Now, since we didn't have a person on voting, I'm going to say a piece, I'm going to ask this big question because I want to push this. You know, um, we had 25 presidential elections, I mean, pr debates, and not one discussion on restoring the voting rights act by Democrats or Republicans. Think about that. 50 years, 52 years after Selma, not one conversation. Why is it, why is it that Democrats often talk about, don't, don't want to talk about race, and when they do, they talk about it when it's like the N-word or David Dukes, Republicans talk about it, but often all, all the wrong ways. We need to get rid of in, in identity politics. 
The reality is in this past election, and, and why is it we're talking about Russian hacking, and I'm asking this question rhetorically to myself. We ask about, talk about Russian hacking, but the system was hacked by racism and voter suppression long before the Russian. I mean, we have to have, and then when you add that, you want to talk about sex. Let's talk about the illicit intercourse. I'm going to talk about sex right now. I'm talking about the illicit intercourse between big business and the Supreme Court in the back room, in the back seat that produced Citizens United, huh? That allows big business to produce what John Nichols called dollarocracy. And so all we're trying to argue for in repairs is that at some place, we have to begin to talk about race and class together and not separate uh, those conversations. Here's my big question. And uh, let me tell you what we're going to do because of the time. We're going to put all of your questions online and give these scholars a chance to go online through repairs of the breach and write answers to them. Uh, questions that you have put here, most, many of them have been talked about tonight, some about the industrial complex system, uh, which has been talked about, talking about how do we bring Native American, not Natives, uh, our, our, our Native brothers and sisters into this conversation. Somebody even raised the question since this, can, can you take the risk of criticizing this system and, and raising a moral resistance if you're not willing to put your body on the line and possibly even death? That's a, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I want to open this last piece. Um, and we're going to ask the question, what is the, is, is, is the resistance to 15 and a union um, rooted in race and class? We were, going to, we were going to talk about what would the minimum wage be today if it had kept pace, you know, and how do we disaggregate those numbers? Like if there are 50, 62 million Americans that make less than $15 an hour, but 54% of African Americans make less. So if you look at that issue, isn't it a race and class issue? You can't just see it as a race. So Tom, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna and I might even do a, 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 a what, do, what do they call it? Online, where you look at everybody on the computer and, Oh, uh, uh, electronic. Chat. What the, yeah, electronic. We might do that with you all since our time is running away. But here's a question I want to get at. And this is a quick answer and a closing. You can talk about hope beyond this or you can deal with it. We had this guy the other day to start talking about we can't be who we need to be and take care of other people's babies. Oh. He claims to be a good person of faith. Steve King, he's, and he said that white hegemony will be all right. He, this is basically what he said. We're going to be all right because black and brown people are going to fight each other. And then he said the reason he votes and the policies that he undertakes is because we can't take care of one another's babies. And, and, and a lot of people, there aren't many people coming out hard criticizing him. I mean, they're saying they're against his statement, but they're not really coming at him. So, in some sense, he's not an anomaly. He may have just said <laughs> what some other folk feel, but they weren't crude enough, like Trump or 45. He says a lot of things that evidently a lot of people agree with, but they're not crude enough or crass enough to say it quite as plain. I, I don't even know how to ask this question except to say, as we close, what are your thoughts about that in terms of what does it say about where we are? What does it say about what we have to do? And what is the kind of hope for determination we have to have in order to, come, in order to continue to push this nation forward? And I want to, and, and even if you don't want to take that question, just take a minute and a half, and we're going to close out mm -hmm. here. Uh, and stay with us, audience, that shows you they're listening to us by live stream. So I have a, a matriarch in my family who, like many of our elders, is in need of assisted leave, living care. Um, and the, to a fault, the most, 99% of the people who are there are CNAs, the, those who take care, wipe the bottoms, and and um, change those adult diapers and 
get the, the person who's wandering who is suffering from dementia, those are black people. So I believe in the circle of life. And if this person is talking about taking care of babies, well, when you're an elder and you're debilitated, you go back to being in an infantile state and you need a lot of care. We're, we start in diapers, we end in diapers, many of us. And this gentleman will probably end up in a situation where it'll be an, a poor, working mm. class, African-American person that's taking care of him. Mm. When he returns to that state of being like a baby. So. Um, what, I would, what my hope is that we can reach out to those people who are CNAs, those people who are fast food workers, those people like my Nana who worked in food services in a, in a state mental health hospital for standing on her feet, you know, ruining her, mm -hmm. her circulation, that we can reach out and have solidarity across class lines, across race lines to say, you are worthy of being seen. Mm -hmm. As an oral historian, you are worthy of being heard. I need to know those stories. I need to know why you look troubled. I need to know, you know, why are you stoic? I need to know how much you're making and what is your plan and, and who's going to take care of you when you get older. So I, I need more compassionate curiosity. That's what I'm encouraging all of us. Mm. When we go into our fast food restaurants, wonder what, how long is this person going to be working here and where are they getting their fresh produce and, and what is their health care situation going to look like? More compassionate curiosity. Um, and so, so that's my, my number one um, Tom? Response to that. Tom, yeah. take a shot at this closing. All right. I, um, I actually, look, you'll never go wrong underesti underestimating that the size of the pure racist core sitting especially, but not exclusively, in the Republican Party. You just can't miss, I mean, anybody who says there isn't a big block of those people is just crazy. And King is clearly like that. On the other hand, he took a lot of criticism for that, too. Uh, less from, you know, from even Republicans. And there is a substantial amount of evidence. I tried one shot at it, but I, I'm not persuaded. And I'm going into the American National Election Survey stuff in a couple of months as they open. A very substantial number of people who voted for Trump had misgivings about him. They didn't actually like everything he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and if I may come right back at the question you posed just about two minutes ago, I think it's very important that one think very carefully here. I've been, the question that has preoccupied me for 30 years, I have written about it a bit, is why don't the Democrats do more to contest that's, vote suppression? That's right. And my answer to that is, you don't have to be a racist to like vote suppression. Why? Right. The answer is, is that it's a money-driven party. The, the, the power is in the hands of the people who pay. If they actually increased voter turnout beyond a certain amount, they'd lose. They can't win. They tilt the whole policy to the exactly. left. That is the essence of the problem, in, especially inside the Democratic Party. These people could lose by winning if they had to do it at a case of a huge voter turnout yeah. uh, increase. That's why it's very, very rare, and only in a few states at very points in time, and most of those efforts come from below. They come from people uh, yeah. like you yeah. and your colleagues. They do not come from major politicians in power. You, you're so right, and I want the audience to remember 171. That's the number of electoral votes you control just in the 13 southern states. All you need is 99 if you, can, if you control those. 26 members of the Senate, 31% of the United States House of Representatives. Flip that over if you register 30% of African Americans in those states and connect them to Latinos and progressive whites, you win. But as you said, there are even persons on both sides of the aisle who don't want that kind of influx because even some of them, Democrat and Republican, would not be elected. So in a sense, it's not the kind of racism, like you said, where we call somebody the mm, but it goes back to Silva's question. Because I think if you participate overtly or covertly in a policy that you know is having a disparate race and class impact, then at some point you gotta own that. So that's a, I'm, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Your minute and a half, we're gonna come on. Um, I I don't remember, I'm trying to remember the author 
where I read it, but it was something to the, to the, to the sort that the, nation, the soul of a nation is known in its way of treating children. The salt. The soul. Soul, great. I of got a you. nation mm. is known by the way they treat their children. Mm. And I shared the statistic of 54% of the children in Hunts Point living in poverty. So something is really morally wrong with the soul of this nation. Right. <laughs> and so the only reason I'm able to be in this space is because my child is being taken care of by somebody else mm. in the community. And so I think that, you know, we need to re-examine um, a lot of what this nation is. And we need to understand the economic base that moves everything in this country. Healthcare. We need to understand what education is and, and how is it that schools are being closed all over the country. And uh -huh. you have the privatization of, of education where folks can access something so basic and so critical for, its, for their own development. And so in terms of like the hope I have is precisely the fact that this ain't new. <laughs> right. And we've right. been surviving. Yep. We just gotta figure out how to win this time. That's right. And so yeah. in order for us to figure out how we win, one of the very important pieces that I feel like the US social movements have to reclaim is the piece of studying history. It's going back, it's taking hold right. of those taking folks, of, yeah. taking hold of those spirits, of those people who resisted, right? And, and learning from not only the victories, but also the failures, right? People often talk about the civil rights movement. There was a lot of ish happening in the civil rights movement right. that we gotta learn, That's right. of, learn from. And so I feel like there is a large opportunity in working with young people. There is a hunger mm -hmm. for change, and not for just like the Mickey Mouse washy washy type of change, like systematic change. And we have to seize that opportunity. But that opportunity needs to be seized with studying, with strategizing, right. and with moving forward in unity as a working class. That's a powerful, and, I, and I, if I would take a little preacher, a, a little preacher um, pastoral, I would say how do we continue to keep winning? Because we win pieces, we step back, we go forward, because I want to own that those spirits before us won against some hell of a odds. And, and they, you know, they kept their eyes on the prize. And then to say that if, if people have, you know, there's a, there was a sermon I think by Walter Wink that says sometimes your enemy shows you your strength. I mean, if folk have to do all of this, you got to steal the Supreme Court, you got to put billions of dollars in the electoral system, you have to stack the votes and pack the votes and vote suppress and kill off your leaders and what, and, and, and then go all the way across the water and find somebody to hack in systems. And I'm not just talking about this past election. But if you got to do all of that, you only cheat who you know you can't beat in a fair fight. Get flowers and candy for doing that fight. Exactly. Not about <laughs> we can't flowers expect and candy. flowers and candy. No, it's about life. It's about a whole lot of other things. That's right. Liz, give me your last closing. Yeah, so I really appreciate this point about uh, taking care of other people's children. Um, I wasn't uh, propelled into the kind of theological scholarship I do from the university. I wasn't propelled from being raised in the church, though both those things are true. I was propelled because... Back about 25 years ago, I lived at a tent city, a homeless encampment of poor white people, poor black people, and poor Latino people living together. And we took care of each other's children. Mm -hmm. It was the value that was at the basis of the work we were trying to do. And, and we didn't just take care of each other's children. We believed that society is supposed to be organized to be taking care of each other's children. Um, and that that was rooted in our understanding of, of the Bible that was rooted in our understanding of, of, of movements of the past. And I, I think that, you know, there are even more of those kind of homeless encampments cropping up all over our country right now because of this crisis, because of, mm -hmm. and more people are going to be, are, are going to be sent into that. And, and if we can take some inspiration from the Walmart workers who, who over their lunch breaks share the food that they have, or, uh, the folks from Chaplains on the Harbor, from Aberdeen, Washington, who share their food stamps so that, so that another family doesn't 
you know, go completely hungry. Um, and, and then not just that sharing, but the, the kind of uh, movement of social organization, of, of movement building, of calling for this new Poor People's Campaign. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, that there's these practices out there where, where folks are, are figuring out a different way of, of living, but then also saying that we can, we can win this. We can organize society this way. You know, that, that to have the kind of abandonment in the midst of abundance. It's not that there isn't enough. We throw away more food than we need to feed everybody, but, but millions in this country are, are hungry. And, and I just think that, you know, if we look at history, um, W.E. Du Bois talked about reconstruction, and he talked about the missed moment of reconstruction. Yeah. Um, here you had this moment where people were coming together. When you talk about the, the history of North Carolina, and you have, you know, progressive, uh, whites and you have uh, slaves and ex-slaves who, who make up you know, the political power of the state and, and who organize a constitution that, that prioritizes people making enough money to live, right? And, and then you have that, you know, this fight against that and, and this missed moment of, of, of being able to, you know, not that we don't have victories, because I mean, the Bible, right, right, right. it's a story of victory and then taking it away, and a story of, of pe poor people organizing across all kinds of lines and having a victory and then it being, you know, taken away and, and us continuing. So, uh, so there, there is this victory that happens in Reconstruction, but, the, but, but we have more victories to win. And, yeah. and right now I think we can win them by actually organizing, uh, you know, what, what King talked about, uh, if the poor can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. And mm. so I think to take that seriously um, right. and, and see the possibility of actually, because it's happening, poor white people in the fight for 15, poor black people, poor Latino folks are coming together and fighting against racism, against militarization, and against poverty, and for you know, voting rights and living yeah. wages and, and what we need yeah. to be able to have a different society. And I think that's very hopeful, and we need to throw our energy um, and our scholarship and yeah. our theology in there. I think that I look at 515, Black Lives Matter, the Mall Monday movement, what's happening with climate, this, what's beginning to happen. By the way, for those of y'all that want to know, we're marching on Paul Ryan's office on Tuesday. Clergy and poor people together, impacted people and doctors at 11 o'clock, because we cannot allow folk to just say it's all Trump's fault. That is, that, that's a mistake in, of strategy. So we're going directly inside the car. We're getting ready to demystify the Congress, all right? Because people have been staying outside having rallies. Well, we're going inside. And so you need to know that. Check it out through Faith in Public Life and Repairs of the Breach. That'll be 11 o'clock on Tuesday. But Liz, you exactly, Wednesday, excuse me, 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Thank you so much. When, Tuesday, we're here. I'll get to that about our, um, our rally here in the state. People, a much more Monday crowd, they just holler out anywhere. It's just, hey, Tuesday, Monday. So Tuesday, we're going into the state legislature. That's with the NAACP and the Forward Together movement, right? But repairers of the breach and faith in public life of Jews, Muslims, and Christians impact the people, people that have pre-existing conditions, people that are sick without health care, and doctors. We're marching into Ryan's office on Wednesday with our holy books marked on passages about health care and with the, putting a face on who will be hurt if we take away health care from, as my friend said, a plan that was flawed, but we needs need to keep the flawed and fix it. We don't need to end the flawed and, 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 and return it to something that's worse than the flawed that we already have. And so thank you for that. Brother Silva. I think the moment is right in American history for us to go beyond elephants and donkeys. Say that one more time, Doc. It, so some of us have been riding that donkey hard, but the donkey is tired. And it's not going to take us to the promised land. Arguably, fundamental changes on race, class, and gender in America have not been the product of electoral politics. They have been the product of social movement politics. And the anger that we witnessed in this last cycle is still there. We can, the moment will allow us to combine race and class if we join the economic populism that Bernie Sanders pushed. Unfortunately, he didn't know jack about race, 
But if we, if we combine that economic populism with a new abolitionism, that is the nexus, that is the connection, that is the future and that is the possibility. And for that to happen, all of us need to be doing less of the electoral politics. And I'm not saying that you should not do and um, vote every four years, but what do you do before and after the elections, yeah? You sit in your house? No, time for us to be part of this movement of this new movement that needs to connect the race, race and class. That is the future of America, and that's the future, actually, of the world. Thank you. I'm glad. Amen. I'm glad Brother Silva just talked about what the moral revival and moral money, all that movement is. is it was one of the great things we've been able to hold integrity in North Carolina, we didn't start criticizing when Republicans got in office. We have a history of over 11 years. I see Al and Gatewood and others. Um, Tyler and others who are out there, of, of challenging the system and challenging the immorality, asking, I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat, is this policy constitutionally consistent, is it morally defensible, and is it economically sane? And if it doesn't meet those three tests, and, as I, and I won't get into it tonight, but Dr. Malvo, if it doesn't meet the blood test, then we don't take it home as our child. <laughs> Some of y'all know about blood tests. I'm just leave that right there. But, you know, just because you say you're with me, no, you got to take a blood test. Does this line up with the Constitution? Does this line up with our deepest religious values? And does this, is this, make, is this economic just for those at the bottom up? If it doesn't meet that, then this is not the baby we're going to care for because ultimately it, it, it's not going to benefit all of us. So I think you're right. Me and my friend Bernie are having a conversation about that because I got a little peeved at him too because he, he talked about a lot of economic populism, but didn't say a lot about race, came to North Carolina, didn't talk about voter suppression. In the state that had the worst voter suppression law in the, in the country, so we have to push all of the elected officials, and that's gonna only happen with the movement um, a, a foot that's a foot in this country. Dr. Malvo, and then we're gonna close. Well, first of all, I wanna just thank everybody for the opportunity, and I know y'all, uh, would you put your questions on the website? We'll answer them, some of us will answer them. Um, <laughs> But anyway, the, the um, Poor People's Campaign was a master design to have people coming up from Atlanta, from Georgia, Alabama, all the way up to Washington to set up Resurrection Tent City, to go to government departments right. and demand what government could do to close these gaps. They were not racial gaps. I interviewed... Uh, Charlene Hunter Galt, years ago, she was covering uh, the Poor People's Campaign. And the absolute joy on her face when she talked about how all of us, black folks and brown folks and gay folks and Native American people, and just the, the diversity of people who organized uh, to you know, go to these government departments. Now I raise that because on Monday, while everybody's talking about Russia, um, Tuesday, everybody's talking about those little two pages of tax returns. Uh, Rachel Maddow got uh, flummoxed, as far as I'm concerned. I love Rachel Maddow, I love her reporting, but them two little pages don't tell me anything. I mean, if somebody turned them into me as a term paper, I'd put an F on them. Uh, uh, Monday, President Trump, oh, I said it, gosh. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, okay, somebody can hit me a button. Heal. <laughs> the 45 signed an executive order directing the Office of Management and Budget to propo quote, propose a plan to reorganize governmental function and eliminate unnecessary agencies, components of agencies, and agency programs. It gives the heads of agencies, his cabinet, 180 days to submit a reorganization plan. Already in the uh, department of HUD, the um, office that took care of minority of, of environmental justice has been cut so badly that the brother who led it has left. Uh, obviously, the, the blueprint for the Poor People's Campaign was that we believe that government intervention would make a difference in the quality of life and the terms and conditions of life for those who were excluded. And that's true in terms of legislation, in terms of access to housing, in terms of any number of things. What this plan from 45 is doing behind our backs, because have you seen this on the front page of the New York Times? That's right. No, you saw the little two pages, the little pitiful tax return. He picked the only year that he paid taxes. 
you know, the only year that he paid taxes. And he said, see, I paid taxes one time, y'all. Um, meanwhile, literally attempting to decimate government. Now, I don't think any of us would, we all know that, that there is government waste. We all know that we could be more efficient, but we don't necessarily need to have, especially targeted programs, uh, eliminated. Brother President, I, know you, I don't know if you were up there or not, when they, when they, when they marched y'all through, never mind, I'm not, I'm not gonna fuss at you. I ain't gonna fuss at you, but here's what I'm gonna say. You didn't see me. You know what? Yeah, yeah, but you probably saw me, I, never mind. Um, <laughs> Anyway, long story short, I think that we've been very short-sighted in looking at what's in the White House. Why would we want the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges to be in the White House with Steve Bannon, Omi Rossi, um, what's the girl who doesn't know how to close her legs while she sits on the couch? Uh, uh, Con, uh, Kellyanne. <laughs> you know, but I mean, we have to look ahead and think ahead about some of these things because Steve Bannon giving input to the White House initiative on HBCUs? Right. Excuse me. So what has happened in the past in terms of fighting and resistance is that we win our skirmishes and that we act like we won the battle. We, we, we have victories and we should, we should celebrate every victory because Lord knows we have had them. We have had enslaved people run away. You know, we have had people throughout the years. There are so many cases that we could lift up. But then we stop and say, oh yeah, we had a victory. Now this is a continuing fight. This is, the, right this minute, we need to be out there. Um, I'm gonna try to see y'all on Wednesday. Um, but to sit here and say, let's start eliminating departments, what will Betsy DeVos, who does not believe in, uh, in, in education, only school choice, told y'all that uh, HBCUs were school choice. See, she would tell you that, that an aunt picked a charter school if the honey was in front of the aunt in the charter school. You know, I mean, she sees everything. Everything lends us through school choice. Mm -hmm. But what does this mean for post-secondary education? What, and what does it mean for the training of our workforce? What does it mean in the longest of runs if we decide that we're going to segment people out of educational possibilities? So then, as a Sister has said here about the globalization of the workforce, it means that everybody will have an H-1B visa and all of us will be cleaning somebody's house and taking care of somebody. So basically, we have to think long-term and persistent. And that's, what, that's why, really, uh, Reverend Barber, when you call, I come. Mm -hmm. Because Moral Mondays has been consistent. We've been out there every Monday, sometimes Tuesdays, you know, rain and snow, just consistent. What we lack in our movement is consistency. What we have too much of is complacency. What we have too much is a corporatized civil rights movement where people are forced to go hat in hand to corporations to ask them to fund the operations of, I'm not gonna call the roll, but y'all know who I'm talking about. And I'm cr not criticizing the organizations, I'm criticizing us. Mm -hmm. If the NAACP has to go to corporate America for operating funds, what can the NAACP say? If the Urban League has to go to corporate America for operating funds, who has, when are they muzzled? And so we have to not only put on our marching shoes, get behind Reverend Barber and those prophets like him who are challenging the system, but we have to dig in our pockets and throw a few dollars out there too so that we can fund our own movement. Because if we cannot fund our own movement, you know, we will be silenced. Because the Koch brothers have an unlimited amount of money. Mm -hmm. These other people have an unlimited amount of money. They don't like anything more than to hop in bed with civil rights leaders. The Koch brothers have given money to the United Negro College Fund, to the Thurgood Marshall Fund. But this is money has strings attached to it. Mm. So understand, you know, like I said, follow the dollars. And we have to rekindle the spirit of the Poor People's Campaign and refuse 45 the possibility of dismantling our government That's right. for the service of predatory capital. That's right. Well, and Dr. Malvo, as we close, I was just thinking of my history that it was right after slavery during Reconstruction, Reconstruction, 
that we began to see this movement and there was a raising of taxes so that the government could participate in undoing what the government had did. Slavery was government sponsored and constitutionally sanctioned. Deconstruction of reconstruction began with a call for tax cuts. It began with changing the Supreme Court. It began with the undermining the right to vote, but not calling it straight out. Um, we're doing it against black people, but just saying poll taxes and saying, well, if you had the money, you can vote, so this is not racist. But it was deconstruction. Steve Bannon told us huh, at CPAC, he said it openly, what the focus was to deconstruct the administrative state, i.e., to tear apart all of the all of these the, the, the governments, uh, programs put in place to address the issue of systemic racism and classism, and refunnel that money back to the wealthy. That's what deconstruction does. He said it. He said that's why I'm in the White House, and this kind of deconstruction has its roots in the deconstruction of reconstruction so that the former slaves would be put back in a position where they could only be slaves once again, but it would just be through the farming system and the agrarian culture. I mean, and that's why we, have, we, we, we can't act as though we've not seen this before. Some of this, this reclamation and deconstruction after a period of partial reconstruction is as American as apple pie. But we've also seen people stand up before and fight it before. And that's why we have to have panels like this and grown up conversations and strategy sessions. You know, that's why we have to push somebody just the other day uh, was saying to me how they had made friends with, with um, Ryan because he was a good guy. See, then that you can't deal with racism and system about whether or not people smile or whether or not they're good guys. You have to open that policy up and disaggregate it. You have to look at the impact and what's really going on. They can smile at you all day long. I never will forget when somebody said about, um, uh, as we close, somebody said about Jeff Session, and a black man said, well, he visited me when my wife had a baby. And I thought, I said, but that's not what we're talking about. Where did he stand on voting rights? Where did he stand on immigration rights and LGBT rights? Where did he stand on living wages and health care? And, and, and I wanted to scream at the TV. I wish I was in the hearing because I just said to my brother, the slave master visited women when they had babies. I would have said, Strom Thurmond loved black women. Had a black girl, young girl, he got pregnant, had a baby. And Jesse Hams hired black folk. That doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're participating in systemic racism and classism. Policy, that's what we have to address. And so tonight, um, you know, as we close, be careful of how con artists and con artists work and how authoritarianism and fascism works. They both lie. They both keep people focused on the wrong things. Right when the news is changing, they will try to do everything they can to change the subject. And fascism and con artists always try to deconstruct what ought to be so that they can run their game. So they can run their game. We have to be the moral dissenters of our time. We have to say, not on our watch. We cannot believe we are weak. We must believe we are strong. And we have to have not only a real conversation about race and class grown up, but a real community, a real movement. We need you all as scholars to help footnote this. On April the 3rd, we're gonna be announcing repairers of the breach and the Cairo Center, the call for a race and class economic justice audit that's gonna be led by some leading economists and many of the people on this panel are gonna be asked to serve on it to begin to look at, not Democrat or Republican, but since 1968, we're gonna start there, 
what kinds of things have been done to either push us forward or take us backwards. And when we talk about this Poor People's Campaign, working with Kairos and others, we're not talking about doing something on behalf of the poor. We're talking about with the poor. And if there's going to be one amendment to it, not only will folk, part of it be people coming to DC, but the other part of it is going to be in state houses. Because you can't, if you're going to change America, you can't just talk about DC. You got to deal with state houses all across this country. So I hope that you have, I want to invite Ms. Roz Pellis to come back out. I want to close with this poem that was written by Langston Hughes at a time of some rough days. And Langston Hughes said this, oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, you can call me ugly, any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain for those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America was never America to me, and yet I swear this oath that America will be out of the rack and the ruin of our gangster death the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain, and all the stretch of these great green states. And we must make America, America again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath that America will be. So I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful and insightful evening. Let's give them another round of applause. I think more than that's in order. <laughs> and I thank you for, uh, for being here this evening and hoping that we'll continue to have these conversations after we leave this space. One last thing before we leave, I'd like to call on um, the communications director for the university who has one quick announcement and then, uh, then we'll close the program for the evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Moses Alexander Green, Chief Communications Officer. St. Augustine's University is participating in the Retool Your School project with Home Depot. And we are asking right now if you'll take out your cell phone Take a selfie. Right now, right now, right now. Can we have the lights up, please? And if you'll take a selfie right now, and if you will put the hashtag SAU underscore RYS17. Again, that is hashtag S. A U underscore R Y S 17. Your entry tonight will help us in our quest to continually uh, beautify the campus. It is hashtag S A U underscore R Y S 17. We thank you. Our 
Distinguished panel will be taking photographs up here with our students. We are asking that you do not rush the stage. Thank you so much, and Reverend Barber has a final comment. Let's give it up for Dr. Silva. Let's give it up for Claudia Dale Cruz. And Dr. Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, Dr. Thomas Ferguson, Michelle Lanier, and Dr. Julianne Malvo. Let's give it up for St. Augustine's College. And let's give it up for the America that we'll be because we're going to keep the fight alive. Forward together. Forward together. Forward together. All right.